All right. Good morning. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us via virtual fourth space on Facebook, on Zoom for the third installment in the co-creating the next generation Cartier series today focused on financing change. This event is part of Dr. Ursula Eker's intensive summer engineering course. So welcome ENCS 691 students. I'm happy that you're all here. Um, in, during this course, these next gen engineers are exploring the multifaceted work involved in kind of creating and redefining urban living. So we're also joined today by a number of panelists, experts in their fields calling in from various locations and we really appreciate you all being here. Uh, before we proceed with introdu introductions, excuse me, I just wanted to remind all the attendees uh, to use the Q&A function in the webinar if you have a question that you'd like to ask during question period or at any time and we'd, we'll make sure to uh, pass it to our mo moderator, Michael Bossert. Um, or you have the option as well as an attendee to raise your hand. There's a raise hand function uh, that you'll note. And when you do so, we will unmute you if you'd like to ask your question using audio uh, with your voice. So that's uh, another option that will activate today. If you're following along on Facebook, you are very welcome to use the comments there and we'll bring your questions to the webinar panelists as well. So I will very quickly now thank you again for being here and pass the microphone to uh, your professor and our good friend, uh, Dr. Ursula Eker. Thanks all. Thank you, Anna, and good morning and welcome everybody to this webinar. I mean, it's, it's a webinar in, in the frame of a teaching course, so you already get the impression this is probably a highlight of, of the course. We've got really important people here today um, who talk about financing. And um, this is an engineering course, but we're looking um, not just at the energy systems and the thermodynamics of um, zero carbon cities, but we, we really want to come up with solutions for, for real projects live in the city. So we've chosen a, a case study that um, our, one of our main collaborators, Nathalie Volant, will present in a, in a minute here in Montreal. Um, in the, the west end of Montreal um, called Lachine East and we're working on this case study um, now on day 10. So um, we've already communicated with many stakeholders from the mayor of Lachine over energy companies, um, building companies, um, sustainability assessment uh, people and all kinds of technology people. So we had a lot of input externally and um, we started to generate ideas on, on scenarios of how such a district could become a true um, eco-district, um, obviously meaning being green and walkable, and, but at the same time contributing to this sort of big challenge of um, climate change, um, so meaning um, to become zero carbon. And zero carbon is something that hasn't been realized um, very much on a, on a district scale. We, we've seen some buildings, um, very ambitious building, individual building projects, but um, I've yet to see a district in Montreal which is really zero carbon. And um, guess what? Um, one of the main reasons why it's not happening yet is probably due to money. It, it's not an obvious um, thing to happen. Um, it requires more initial investment to, to build very high standards, to, to come up with alternative energy, waste and transportation systems. So we have this challenge of, of high initial investments for, to, to really make sustainable districts. And that's why it's not happening automatically. So we need new models um, to finance um, these actions because I think everybody's willing. I mean, the, the political will is there to construct these zero carbon districts. The students are all very motivated to come up with um, new ideas. Um, all the participants we had from um, external, from the external world in the course are very motivated to, to, pro, um, to propose innovative solutions. So I guess in the end, it's, it's the money, which um, is one of the barriers that it, it doesn't yet happen on a, on a big scale. So I'm, I'm really, um, curious to see what um, what new ideas um, this sort of incredible panel of experts can bring today of of how we find new ways of financing um, these sustainable solutions um, and come up with business models proposed business models that um, 
allow to, to have a payback on the long run. And, and all these sort of sustainable solutions will pay back. And every district that is built today will be around for hopefully the next 50, 100, 200 years. So it's, it's not a short term, um, short term project that we are working on. Um, these these um, investments will stay for a long while. So somehow we need to overcome this, um, this barrier of, of high initial investments and, and get to a perspective of longer term thinking to make um, these sustainable districts happening. Um, so, um, as I said, we are in day 10 of the course. By the middle of next week, we will propose um, two scenarios, at least two scenarios for this district, which is currently in the zoning process, um, to, to propose um, hopefully zero carbon solutions. Um, and we will look at all the aspects of buildings, transportation, waste, um, and energy systems. And um, hopefully you can join us um, in the final presentation next week. So to see what the students came up with and we will stay with this um, project um, even after the course um, because it provides an excellent case study for many of the uh, master PhD and, and postdoc works that we're doing in, the, in, this, in my chair um, of sustainable resilient um, communities and cities. So we will stay with this project. So um, all the input that we get today, I think will be very helpful to to support this process of getting things done in real life. And with this, um, I hand over to Michael and my and then my favorite real estate person, Natalie Bonau. Thank you and welcome everybody in the webinar. Hi, good morning. My name is Michael Bossert and um, I will guide you through the program. I'm very thrilled about this program as it came together with puzzle pieces to really um, kind of find great persons making a fantastic match for, for such a workshop. And uh, as Ursula highlighted, uh, we want to make an impact. So we speak about impact financing, about green financing, about sustainable financing, about benefits and how to create win-win situations to really make a change. So welcome everyone and it's fantastic that you can join. And um, I'm very delighted now to introduce Nathalie Volant. I share my screen. Nathalie Volant holds a degree in political science and African studies from McGill University. She began her career as a youth social worker at Montreal and later took over family business. Today, she is the president of the real estate company Gestion Immobilière Covadis and manages an area of more than 1.5 million square feet spread across various heritage buildings in the city, rented by more than 500 SMEs and generating more or nearly around 3,000 jobs. The title of her presentation is Making a Change and Building an Eco Quartier. So I will try to make this now to show the presentation. Give me a second. And um, this here, share screen um, here. The floor is yours, Natalie. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Everything's okay? Good morning. Nice to see you all. And uh, it's been a, a really uh, interesting road to plan this class, to uh, get all the speakers there and, and try to get people outside of the class to be engaged in learning about what are the challenges and the opportunities um, about what we want to do and building a, a carbon neutral or low carbon depends on how we can uh, get there as far as the business models. Um, my company is called Gestion Immobiliaire Covadis. We've been around in Montreal for 25 years. And uh, for those of you who know us in real estate, we like to cause trouble. Um, we like to do that because we want to change um, how real estate is done. And I think that um, this kind of a project as a pro prototype piece is, uh, is something that is exciting for us and at the same time would, would often cause us to lose our hair. So <laughs> it's fun, and, but it's very difficult to change the world. So um, Michael is my clicker. So Michael, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. This is the um, large area of um, the city of Lachine that we're working on called Lachine East. But before we get into that, 
I wanted to speak to you about what traditional uh, real estate um, development ideology usually happens or, or discusses. So usually we start with something called location, 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 the golden rule um, of all real estate projects. Um, the next time we look is uh, the next um, icon that we look at is, is what is the value of short to long term? What is the size and scale of the project? If it's too small, we can't do anything. If it's too big, we can't do anything. We also look at existing zoning changes. So if things are too difficult to change the zoning, often real estate developers won't touch it. When we talk about highest and best use, unfortunately, usually it's high-end residential condos. So the question that we're trying to push to is highest and best use for whom? Um, if we wanna build communities and everybody keeps talking about highest and best use and then it's always a single use, then, then we're gonna have a problem with an echo quartier, which is, more of a live, work, play, learn situation. Heights and density really plays a big factor in business modeling. And obviously financial blends because traditional financing doesn't really work. But then we look at what the project is. And then we kind of go back and forth a lot of times between the design, consulting, the zoning process, public hearings, and the process of the project really changes. But the main job of a real estate developer is return on investment. So the problem is if you are looking that your job is your return on investment and not actually developing communities for humans, it's kind of an issue that you're always confronting problems between the other two. Michael, if you could go to the next slide. Ding. Um, <laughs> so the problem is that we talk about is that we have um, side effects of real estate. I know that doesn't sound uh, interesting. Usually we talk about side effects of other things, but there is side effects of real estate. We look at short-term strategies because we want to make sure that our exposure to risk is as, as, as low and as quick and as painless as possible for the developers. They require profit now, and that really causes a problem because we create demolition and construction waste. It's easier to rip down old buildings and build new ones because it's easier as far as our business plan. We're looking at limited liabilities of the developers to make sure that they um, you know, don't have to take on bad construction projects for too long. We don't have integrated uh, neighborhoods. We have a problem with obviously our carbon footprint, our environmental impacts. People build materials that are quicker to get on the market. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're the right pieces. Um, there's also lots of pressures of the role of government and legislation. But the problem is, is that you over legislate some communities. Um, I always say that investment is liquid. And so developers will leave um, different communities if it's too hard to get that zoning change or, or get what they want as an example. The role of public space and the movement of people is often not even looked at as real estate developers are looking at their projects. And you really have a segregation of um, different neighborhoods because you know, you'll build your social housing over here and you'll build your high end condos there. And, over there is your industrial and over there are some maybe some jobs in the corner. So it really causes a problem for gentrification, cars, uh, urban sprawl, all that kind of stuff. Michael, please ding. So the next uh, problem that we want to talk about is really that everything in development is in silos. We keep talking about these silos. So you have the owner, you have your return on investment, which I always think is very important for people to remember that's how real estate developers look. And then you have your development team, your zoning team, your finance team, your construction team, your marketing team, everybody works by themselves. And so you have no general rule to try to figure out how do you actually address environmental or neighborhood or city strat plan considerations. Michael? So we developed um, something in collaboration with the Harvard School of Public Health um, on sustainable development and leadership. Um, we call it yield development. Um, the whole purpose of this is to kind of really mirror image what Quovatis does as a company. We start with long-term thinking. We look at stakeholders beyond shareholders. So we look at who's going to be affected by our projects. We look at cradle to grave material and design conversations. We look at mixed and inclusive use um, in communities because if we really want to talk about better neighborhoods and, and lower carbon footprint, we need to be able to do the whole concept of live, work, play, learn. We look at all these opportunities for accessibility and we create the project with the purpose in mind. And once we create those purposes, we don't modify from that. The project will modify, but the purpose will not. So it ends up turning out to be flexible, modular, lower carbon, ecological footprints of our buildings are our, our main priorities. But then you actually have walkable, livable, you know, happy cities where we actually have the opportunity to create a profit on projects that are good for communities. So we kind of tried to play around with words and we used return on human investment. 
if you start looking at humans in the equation of profit, then you make sure that your, your goals are always aligned with what your mission is. Michael? So the problem with this um, is, is our investment challenges, right? So when people are looking at profit now and short-term thinking, collaborative approaches don't really look like it's something that is interesting. It takes too long to have conversations. I know best as a developer, you shouldn't be telling me what I should do. And if you have conversations with bankers, it's even worse than that. But when you look at the investors, right, most of the investors require a 25% return on their investment. But then if the costs of building better, as an example, are, are higher, you know, for building footprints or uh, insulation or roofing systems or whatever, who pays for that? Because the developer or the investors don't want to cut down their 25% often, and they'll just pass it on to uh, the end users who are not yet ready to pay a higher price for their condo or their residential uh, apartment because they're possibly going to be moving. Um, within the return of that investment, which is often between 20 and 30 years. People don't want to look um, that long. The lenders just look at their underwriting with their boxes, right? And so if it doesn't make sense to them financially, they're just not going to finance us, which is kind of a problem. And they look at risk as a short-term analysis, but they're not really looking at the risk of the community of building bad projects. They're looking at the risk of making sure that they get paid back. Um, but it is very clear in the uh, research out there that better projects do pay. Um, we are a B Corp, we're one of the Quebec's first B Corps, and uh, it's very clear the documentation shows that B Corps do pay back their loans much more than more capitalists who will quickly, as you can see with COVID, you know, shut down uh, jobs, uh, shut down projects immediately if it affects their bottom line. The trades we discussed yesterday in one of our classes as well, they don't really have an incentive to do uh, to reduce pricing because what they're really doing is looking at a percentage of their income in their own salaries is based on how much they charge uh, in an overall project. So the trades are not really looking at making sure that we can actually have a business model that works. And if you look at city planning, they're really not taking into consideration the final uh, financial aspects of a developer. So they're like, oh, you know, you should build 10% park and you should build, you know, 20% social and affordable housing community opportunities. But it doesn't necessarily mean that a financial return can really make sense for these investors and the bankers that are already doing that. So the problem is, is that, you know, the city wants this and the lenders want this and it's starting to really become very complicated. Then we bring in university research. The situation is that the science is out there. We know how to build low carbon communities. We just don't know how they're gonna get built because we can't figure out the financial models, which is why it's so, so important that the students also understand that you know, when you're looking at you know, solar panels or any of those wonderful, awesome things, like how do I pay for them? How does it make sense? How do I make sure it's incorporated in a project that, that'll work over the long term? And of course, the citizens, they're like, I love this, but not in my backyard. So if I'm going to have to, you know, increase density or have more cars in the area for the short term until we get some public transportation, they just don't want it. They just rather be like, I'm better with where my views are, that there's no project here. I would rather it just not move ahead. Michael? So the opportunities are almost the opposite. So if we look at long-term communities and what's in it for me, we really have to make sure that all the stakeholders are properly looked at. So the investors need to start looking at patient capital, prototyping different projects to crack, crack the code to figure out what are the new business models that will make sense. Um, lenders need to be looking at different types of underwriting loans and loan guarantees. And the CMHC, the Canadian Housing and Mortgage Corporation, has some really cool models around you know, amortization, amount of years, so it really affects our cash flow, meaning it affects it better, and looking at lower interest rates for projects that actually have a better return on community investments. The trades should be looking at volume as opposed to each individual project. By doing things better, you become an, a differentiated uh, trade for people like me who want things um, different and then have an opportunity to make a better environmental impact. City planning should be looking at um, incentives, not always about legislation, but by creating bonus densities or community value adds that allows you to build more buildable square footage so that I can offset the cost of this carbon community that um, would be having a better complete community approach. We should be looking at um, a transparent process. And I think that Lachine is really doing that um, by making sure that the whole community and all the stakeholders are involved so they understand how it affects everything. 
we also need to be investing in public transit. That's not a developer that's going to do that. But if the city or the municipality and the provincial and the federal government are all looking at building better, they also have to put their money where their mouth is. If you're looking at university research, I think it's really cool to create a toolbox. And this is what we're trying to do with the CERC program to try to figure out what is the best bang for my buck? So if I go to do a green roof and a better insulation, you know, how does that affect my business model? It's pretty exciting to work alongside the students to make that happen. And the citizens need to look at changing their behavior or their tolerance for density, that density is not a bad thing, and that gentrification could actually be well done, where you have better road structure, better safety and security for communities, where you're still guaranteeing better affordability rates. When you have higher density, you actually reduce the price per square foot, um, which is then passed on to um, a different, um, to the end buyers. Michael? So 3.2 million square feet, 300,000 square meters, four developers on this large, large piece of property, which is called the Echo Capitier for Lachine East. And it includes nonprofit citizens and highly engaged uh, people at the city who are really trying to make a difference and create a different master planning process for this area. Michael? The community grow goals are really about integrating new, um, the new project directly with the existing citizens. They really want to make sure that you have a live, work, play, learn opportunity where everything is available within 10 minutes and that it becomes a walkable city for them. So it, they want to be able to look at an environmental showcase that is beyond the business as usual models. But the challenges are right now, everything in Lachine is three stories and they're still worried about density for a higher eco quartier. Public transportation is not adequate. Over 70% of the current um, citizens are using uh, their cars because they're just the area is not well served as much as it should be for public transportation. The sites are very, very contaminated. There were old industrial sites. Uh, we also have a problem that there's gonna be more than double of the new, the new residents will be double the existing residents. So how do you create that integration? And really the developers are not necessarily the most up to date as to trying to figure out what, what does an echo cafe mean and how do you deliver that and how does that affect the bottom line for them? And we really need to be looking at community, uh, complete community and, and what happens with the heritage, the industrial heritage of the site, how do we incorporate that? Michael? So we kind of created eight goals. Uh, uh, Based on this, we have something called the Yield Development Playground. So we create eight goals around what's really important around the net zero carbon community, which is our main purpose of this project. And between the eight outer lines, we figure out how do we get, you know, how do we get to the how? How do we make it happen? It's, that could be another presentation, but I just wanted to show you that the value system for the Lachine East project. Go ahead, Michael. So the opportunities is that this PPU, which is a master planning piece, is taking into consideration all of the stakeholders. There's a possible tramway coming in, a better bike rat pass, a walkable neighborhood, civic assets. They want to build a school and a community and a gym facility. They want to increase public park and have open access to private spaces, which now will become more public. Um, they want to create a prototype of wellness and social integration, of course, with the 2020-20. And of course, the wonderful collaboration with Concordia and how we're trying to make things different. We're also looking at uh, circular economy and sustainable development goals. And we're looking at how are we are able to value the industrial heritage of the area by creating more jobs. Go ahead, Michael. The developer challenges are really that they're not really convinced that the community, um, the, the input that they have is something that they can deliver at the end. Uh, they're worried about their bottom line and how are they going to make it financially viable. They're looking at saying, now oh, the planning process is taking a really long time. And some of these developers have been sitting on these properties for many years and have to create the carrying, uh, pay the carrying goals. So who pays the extra for creating this net zero community? Um, the environmental goals are often taken as a second step to, you know, what are my profitability and, and the bottom line goals of, of where I need my investments. The problem is also the not lack of knowledge on how to actually build this and looking at short-term profits. So we need to create business opportunities to have this access of integration. So we have to have you know, conversations about how do you mix socially different economic groups and uh, what is the role between public and private and how do you make sure that the uses of the community are also offset by the residential offering that is needed for the financial models. So we really need innovation, Michael. 
the opportunities are that we can actually reduce our risk um, for holding the costs of these properties that are not going to sell or rent as quickly as possible. Because what you're doing is you're getting uh, the people who want to buy and live in there part of the conversation. If you actually develop something that people want, they'll take it quicker and you don't need some marketing um, guru to say that there's a woman on top of a condo tower with a glass of champagne to be able to sell these condos. You're actually selling condos of people that they, you know, of, of a community that people want. Um, and so I always talk about it as an allergy to empty space. One of my investors has, has said that to us. If we can actually fill these properties quicker, it reduces our, our, our risk in the investment and allows us to invest more in the net zero. We want to be able to make incentives that people can see that it's possible so that people will copy us. We want to make sure that we're having an opportunity of a business plan that changes things. And by creating these win-win business models in collaboration with different universities and global best practices, we could be able to mitigate the negative impacts of gentrification and also be able to have cross-pollination between uh, different idea systems and different trades. Uh, there will be less crime, more jobs, maybe less social housing will be needed because people in the social housing will actually get jobs in the community. And we want to be able to define what is the new role between public and private. Michael? So by doing that, you have a three-step approach. In the design development, you have to think about these goals. In the construction, what does that mean for net zero? And for property management, after the buildings are handed off, how do you make sure that the end users are continuing to practice the goals that were set forth in the design process? Go ahead. The challenges and opportunities are great. And I think that the next few speakers are really gonna inspire you to figure out what are the roles of the possibilities? Like we already know what's wrong, so how do we fix it? But we're working together with the stakeholders beyond the shareholders, we have the opportunity to create common solutions. We need to value engineer the possible. Um, there's a beautiful picture of one of the bridges that was built by Dominion Bridge. Um, there's a piece missing in the middle. Uh, we wanted to use that as an inspiration to figure out how do we figure out what works? What is the prototype? One of my mentors is Nelson Mandela, and Mandela, my gosh, and he has a great quote that says, it's always, it always seems impossible until it's done. I feel very confident that with the group of CERC, we can figure it out. Thank you. End of my presentation. Thank you very much, Natalie. It was impressive, and I think it's kind of the, the basic of today's um, kind of workshop to understand this background. And um, what I kind of learned very fast that we need to create win-win situations that there are not half tipsy persons standing on skyscrapers. <laughs> and um, like, are there some questions? Like, I just want to repeat because I, I saw that a lot of participants joined after the introduction that uh, if someone has questions, you can write them in the Q&A or you can as well just raise the hand and we can uh, put you in the conversation. And uh, if there are very quick uh, questions for understanding something, otherwise I would like, um, as this was kind of the introduction, like uh, preparing the ground for the, uh, today's workshop, I would like to continue immediately uh, with our next speaker. But uh, I would like just to give you the possibility um, to kind of still raise some questions. Are there any, or are there some from the panelists to, to understand anything? No, if not, then I would like to introduce um, Louis-Philippe Bolduc. Give me a second, I need to share screen again. Um, one second. I need to go out here. Um, one minute. Okay, I have it here. And so and here and now I need to make this work. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> so um Hello, Louis-Philippe Bolduc. It's a pleasure to have you in the workshop. Um, Louis-Philippe Bolduc holds a degree in civil engineering from the University de Quebec, and he was working for several engineering companies and a uh, lecturer in the University de Quebec and the Université Laval. Today, he's working as project manager in the company Energère, 
a leading energy service company that provides services for smart and sustainable cities. The title of his presentation is Costs and Impact of Changing Building Elements. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, so uh, I just uh, start with the share my, my screen. So just uh, two, uh, two moments, please. Uh, OK, share. So perfect. I think that's uh, everybody see my presentation. So uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to me to be here with you today to talk about the cost and impact of uh, changing building elements. It's also for me uh, a first experience because it's the first time in my career that uh, I have an English presentation today. So it's very funny and uh, uh, we have all raised, uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> so uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that everything will be fine, but sometime maybe I, I will search my words. So so uh, no worry uh, about that. So um, just uh, before to start who I am, uh, so like uh, Michael has uh, mentioned to you, I'm uh, Louis Bolduc, but uh, just more uh, detail about my professional biography. I started my career in uh, 2011 at Pomerleau, a big general contractor in Montreal. So uh, I've had the first seven years of my career in this business. I have, uh, I had the opportunity to work on major design, uh, design build project in Montreal, like the underground arena of Westmount. You have uh, who are, who, who is for a uh, lead gold uh, certification building. Uh, and uh, I have uh, also participated on the construction of Place Belle in uh, Laval, uh, major uh, arena for uh, the the, the Canadian of Montreal. And after that, in uh, 2017, I joined the Hey Plus uh, Conception and uh, Construction uh, Management team. Uh, this is an integri integrative uh, business who want to change the mindset uh, of uh, how we realize projects. Uh, and uh, this is a, a good experience to me to participate at a fast growing company in Montreal. But uh, uh, in the last uh, three weeks, I began in my career at Energy in the perspective uh, of uh, make a better uh, change in the industry about our, uh, our perspective and our, about our, um, our um, uh, different uh, opportunity to manage our energy system in the city and building. Uh, in um, complement of uh, my business uh, career, I am also a lot of implication and I'm uh, very involved in some organization like uh, the CHBC uh, in Quebec and also the organization of Equabitation, where I'm the chairman of the board since the last February. So uh, this is just a little introduction about me this morning. But um, also I want to explain you uh, the reality of energy because I will talk about the uh, about I will talk about the relation about our energy in this presentation and I think that it is appropriate to explain explain to you uh, what energy can be done in this uh, sector of activity. So uh, energy is, is a leading energy service company um, where our, um, our um, vision is to uh, provide innovation solution to increase the energy efficiency and uh, reduce the operation main maintenance and expenses of uh, building. We are three uh, main uh, way of activity in smart city, uh, mainly in the uh, light uh, street uh, equipment, uh, also in building energy performance uh, in the existing building to uh, we uh, we have uh, more than 100 project uh, where we have uh, realized some optimization of the performance uh, of the building. And uh, more recently, we are involved in the real estate infrastructure mainly the loop energy to connect building uh, um, between uh, between their um, between uh, each other uh, so uh, the three are mainly uh, principal uh, way of activity of uh, the uh, business what is my vision of uh, the the situation uh, where we are uh, today 
what I want to talk with you today is about uh, the, the the ground reality that uh, I uh, I saw like an engineer. So um, the the I I consider me like an optimistic guy, and um, it's for that reason that I talk about the Averman Mantel transistor. I think the first thing that we need to do, and we need to um, um, that we need to uh, understand is uh, we live in a context of our uh, history that we make uh, um, a reflection and we talk about the transition. And I think that this graphic is interesting because everything is a, a life is a risk. So uh, how can we evaluate the risk? Uh, we have the ha uh, habit to evaluate the risk with the traditional, uh, traditional way. And uh, we need to make a transition about how we evaluate the risk to shift with the modern risk. And this modern risk will, will be impact about the climate change that we live now. And that uh, it's not the question about to, uh, um, to uh, um, sorry, but um, the, 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 the transition is more to um, understand uh, how we can uh, live with the climate change because the climate change is real and we will uh, live with it. Um, so about that, uh, it's not the time to search new solution. I think that the, the, the context of uh, green building uh, um, give us the opportunity to have a lot of technical solution. It's now the time to take action. And uh, I think that we have some trends to consider to be able to introducing uh, the uh, green building in our uh, reality and to integrate the perspective and the opportunity to the green building in the management risk that we take in consideration when we want to realize a project. Uh, so for me, we have five uh, trends that I want to talk with you today. The first one is our relation with the carbon and energy. I want to talk with you about the circular economy that uh, we have a lot of opportunity with that to change our perspective and manage differently our risk. Also the big data and the technology. I'm a big fan of the benchmarking and uh, of the data because it's a great opportunity to concrete to have a clear vision of what is the advantage and what is the real impact of green building and green measure that we introduce in our project. And finally, our reflex of change the mentality. And it's, this is maybe the part that I will pass the most of my time because for me is the change, the, the, the change of, our, of our mentality is maybe one of the big challenge that we have. It's how can we change our mentality? How can we work differently with each other to be able to introduce uh, the, the solution? So we, uh, oh, so yes, we need to manage differently our risk, but I think that we more necessarily uh, change the, our, uh, uh, the, the, the way that we work each other. And uh, finally, sure that COVID have an uh, impact about uh, the, the future and the next uh, option that we can uh, work. Um, so, why why is it so important to consider the, the the better design of our building? Because just we need to know that in North America and in Europe we spend almost of ninety percent of our time inside a building. We all we are always in a building. We live in a building, and maybe that this uh, number is so impressive. Um, I think that is also a reason why maybe we so diminish and we don't consider how it's important uh, to uh, make more intention in the building. Maybe we uh, diminish the importance because this is so close from new. We are always in the building, so maybe we diminish the importance because we take it for uh, for uh, a norm and we don't realize that we can be uh, better with uh, our uh, building. The, the first uh, perspective and the importance that we need to know is uh, that um, it's about the eliminate the building emission. 
just a little graphic to show you uh, some uh, uh, critical scenario and op of option of uh, the um, emission of carbon emission if we uh, do nothing about uh, in the, in the horizon of um, 200, uh, 2100. Um, what is the objective you, is the first uh, line that you can see. Uh, if we want to limit the climate change below two degree, we need in the perspective of the next uh, 30 years, we need to eliminate the fossil fuel. Uh, this is a big, big, big challenge. And why I show you this graphic is because I think that we are now at uh, a first step of, uh, of a new era. Uh, this new era is now we are able to put an economic impact on this important to make a transition, a transition sorry, about the fossil fuel. Uh, what I want to say about that is um, it's because we, um, um, we have uh, now uh, more opportunity and more technology. They are more most uh, efficient, and uh, the, the 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 new project that we are able to realize now, uh, we are not um, obligated to consider the fossil fuel. And this is the first time that clearly we have new option. They are more they are most uh, efficient. So. In short, that is a big step, you know, uh, 2050 with uh, the hand of fossil fuels is a big challenge, but we need to give this uh, number in head. And also we need to consider now the decarbonization of our industry. This is a, maybe for me one of the most important words. For me, the decarbonization is a, a very important uh, so, uh, option to consider and we need to make more attention on it. And how can we explain it? How can we introduce the, um, uh, the, the implication of the carbon of uh, in our project, we need to talk about the impact carbon now. We need to talk about uh, this uh, type of uh, challenge. So um, for me, it's an evidence that if we are able to introduce the carbon uh, vocabulary in our project, in our industry, we will help us to uh, realize a success, the challenge that we need to uh, accomplish. When I said that we have now uh, other opportunity to uh, realize project, one of uh, maybe the great uh, option that we have is our relation with our uh, energy and how can we better management the energy in our building project. They have one of the case uh, study that I want to talk with you today and is the loop energy. Um, we have two examples on this uh, picture. The first at your left is the case of the Surrey in British Columbia. Uh, and uh, the other one is a case in Montreal that Energy is involved with, is that uh, Technolo uh, Technopole Angus in the east of the Montreal. So what is it interesting about uh, the energy, uh, the loop of energy is you can connect each building of a new neighbor together. and. Uh, when you have some different function uh, in the neighbor, you can uh, exchange between uh, different building, uh, the heat and the cool for um, that globally, how the neighbor consume, uh, con the, how to globally, uh, the objective is to uh, each building uh, less is consumption. So uh, if you are able to exchange the heat and the cooling, so uh, it's sure that uh, a building uh, can uh, reduce its consumption. So if all the building can reduce their consumption, we will be in a good uh, way and uh, we will can create some uh, advantage uh, for the user of uh, this building to reduce their uh, bill of uh, consumption. So uh, this is uh, a new, um a new uh, kind of opportunity because you, you see the energy center 
on the um, picture of uh, left, this type of uh, energy center can create can be uh, very. You can have a lot of opportunity and option to uh, create your energy. So you can put a solar panel. You can uh, use uh, wine. You can use. Uh, um, uh, the uh, biomet. So um, this is why you can uh, have a, a, a big impact with your neighbor because uh, your uh, central energy center is uh, also uh, able to be a clean energy uh, generation. So um, this is one of the, the great options that we need to explore and to sensibilize in the new development because uh, in the perspective also of uh, economy, of uh, circular economy, um, you are able to uh, make exchange and you are able to create some uh, uh, advantage. Uh, it's not an obligation that each building uh, create its own energy and consume its own energy. The majority of building in our life uh, are, I, I'm not sure of the exact number, but mainly more than 50% of the time, the building had just too much energy. So uh, in this point, it's just a, a, a no brain option that uh, if we can share together this uh, building. I have talked also of the circular economy. For me, uh, this is uh, the main. Uh, this is one of the most important uh, change of our uh, way to make uh, business. We need to introduce a perspective of circular economy in our uh, project, also uh, in building or in the the city. We need to realize the impact of the linear economy uh, in. Um, in uh, which we uh, work in uh, presently. If we are able to introduce the uh, circular economy thinking, I'm sure that we are able to have a more um, perspective view, a more global view to understand where our project create the most impact uh, for a project, uh, um, um, a standard project, you have a lot of resources that you consume during the construction, but you have also a lot of resources that you uh, expand during the uh, operation and maintain life cycle. And at the end, the majority that uh, of the majority of building at the end of their life, we just demolish it and uh, we don't consider what is the opportunity to create uh, new uh, materials or uh, recycling materials of the building. So we need to um, uh, realize our project with the circular economy because with this approach, we can be able to uh, evaluate and see the impact of each step of a project and minimize the impact at each of these um, uh, step of the project. Uh, one of the, the um, one one of the most clear uh, explanation of the circular economy that I like to show and uh, to uh, to uh, see is uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, uh, and I invite you to uh, read read more about the, the circular economy of uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Another. Uh, complement about the circular economy is also our re relation with uh, building materials. Um, we need to uh, be more uh, sensitive about uh, our choice of materials when we build a building. And now we have the opportunity to have some tools in the industry to help us to find and to evaluate the impact of these materials. I have a three uh, logo of uh, the different tools that you can uh, find in the industry at the right of this picture. So, uh, healthcare project declaration, HPDC, um, declare and cradle to cradle. These three type of tools, they are very interesting because you are able to have a clear portrait and clear uh, information about what is the impact of all uh, project that you want to choose for your project. Um, we have um, 
uh, we have uh, also some um, uh, type of uh, information with uh, the life uh, analysis life analysis cycle um, in uh, lead certification, but they are three tools that they only work uh, for uh, this type of uh, information. And this is very interesting because we need to change our perspective when we, this is the time to choose our materials. And um, we need to have tools to help us. We, this is my perspective, this is my mindset. And I know that if we uh, have some tools to, uh, um, they uh, can that we can use uh, like a guide that like a guide ensure that it, that it uh, will help us to make better choice uh, after the car decarbonization after the circular economy we need to talk about the big data and uh, the technology um, it's sure that the for me the building information modeling the BIM approach uh, is very interesting because like you can uh, see with this picture uh, this is the same mindset and the same approach than the uh, life life cycle analysis that I talked previously in the uh, previous uh, picture and this is a mindset and we need to have a reflection of each step of a project and each phase of a building life cycle so which the beam and uh, for building information modeling you are able to collect data and demonstrate the benefits of the building in each of this uh, life and uh, after that we are able to take a better decision and we are able to optimize the um, operation and the cost of the building uh, I have an example of you at the upper left of the um, building information building during the construction. So now we are, this is um, a view of the uh, Videotron Center at uh, Quebec City. And this is one of the first project in Quebec that we have uh, 100% integrate the building information during the realization and the construction. And this is very impressive because during the construction, and when uh, you visited the, the, the construction site, you were able to see where the coordination was stopped because everything was cut like a, with a knife uh, in the, 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 the site because the coordination was stopped at the right, at the, at the um, place in particularly. So um, in on the site, you can uh, see this uh, coordination in reality. So this is very impressive. And uh, with the BIM, we are also uh, able to reduce the, um, uh, the, 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 um, we are able to reduce uh, the error on the construction shine. And we know that more the, uh, the, 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 the problem that we uh, have on the construction shan, construction site, sorry, can, uh, um, can uh, uh, impact the cost and also the quantity of materials that we need to uh, put on the, the building. And after that, the intelligent build, building management is also a very uh, interesting avenue that we need to consider because uh, with this data, we are able to show the reality of the, 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 the performance of our building. And one of my dream is that we be able to change this perspective. Uh, I, I, don't under, I don't understand why we are not able to create a competition between the building. Uh, I think that with the intelligent building management, we will be able to create a software or, uh, of an app that we can uh, show the performance of different building in the city. And uh, after that, you are um, a tenant and uh, you want to choose a building for your office, you are able to uh, show what building is the most uh, efficient about your uh, vision and what is important for you. So uh, I think that with the intelligent building management, we should be able to create this type of uh, challenge between building to create a new perspective and create a new type of decision making uh, in um, vision of uh, choose a better and also realize better building. 
So now, how can we do it? Uh, just a, a small picture that uh, show you uh, my uh, mindset about that is the biggest challenge is us. Uh, it's the human challenge now. Uh, we can have a, a lot of solution. We can have a lot of technology opportunity, but at the end, we need to change our perspective. We need to uh, break the silo. Uh, like uh, Natalie mentioned in his presentation, uh, our industry is very uh, is very um, uh, is not integrated. Uh, each each professional or each person work is in own silo, and it's sure that um, it's sure that um, how how we um, um, sorry. And ensure that uh, how long we continue to uh, work in with this silo, ensure that we will we not be able to create the change that we know. So when I say it's that time to take action, our behavior is, is strongly dictate our inability to initiate the environmental transition. So I have for you uh, two graphic. Uh, we we'll show you in first the traditional process of project and how can we realize different uh, way to realize a project with the integrative process. Uh, this uh, graphic is based on the seven group uh, and Brill Read, the book of uh, the integrative design guide. For me, it's one of my Bible. I realize a lot of opportunity and thing with this book is very, very interesting. So I invite you to consider and read this book if the uh, realization, the different type of realization of project is uh, Suggest that uh, interests you. So the traditional process, uh, it's like uh, you see um, uh, res res rationalization of the op option to just uh, integrate at the end of uh, the project and it's sure that this type of uh, realization have a lot of uh, challenge because uh, each person work in his own things and we have not the opportunity to integrative at the beginning of the project. So integrative process because uh, wh uh, why is so interesting It's just because everything work together uh, at the beginning of the project and we create loop. So, uh, so with the loop, we are able to create the reflection that we need and when the team is uh, okay with the decision we can pass at the second step of the project and with this type of uh, approach we minimize the risk we, we, we minimize the budget and we minimize also uh, the lack of time and the quality on your project Always remember that we, ha that we have three success factors in a project. This will never change. We have three based on the project and is the budget, the schedule and the design. If you want a project with a lot of design and uh, a lot of time, it's sure that your schedule will be more long. If you have a lot of budget and you have, if you have a, a small budget and you have a short time to realize your project, it's sure that the design will be less. So this is uh, like you can see, uh, with the small graphic at the right, uh, we, we don't, have the possibility to have the same level uh, of importance for the three base of a project. This is not possible. So we need to check choose. We need to choose. We need to take decision at the start of the project. We need to realize what we want to focus on it. And it's for this that the integrative project is interesting because if you have all the team and you have a client who understand the reality, you can able to fix what is the base of your project. Do you want a design project? Do you want a budget project? Do you want a schedule project? So it's for this reason that we are maybe 
able to create some uh, more uh, spectacular project is just because the team is on the same page and you, we understand all the same uh, objective of the project. And this is not the, um, for me, uh, uh, this is for me the, the main point of my uh, presentation for me because this is what we need to understand when we start a job. We need to create the good objective. We need to put people on the same page. And we see um, in a lot of project, in, sorry, we see in a lot of project that this question is not uh, on the table at the beginning and people go in their own direction and we have a less of uh, comprehension and we have a miss of communication. The real challenge is on uh, this uh, type of uh, uh, discussion that we need to create and uh, have a type and, uh, and uh, a, a context of project that we uh, able to uh, realize uh, this uh, question and discussion. Also, uh, uh, another uh, graphic that I, li that I like is the McLemy curve. Just to realize you that more the, the the, in the time, this is more and most difficult to put change and this change is, and this change, if you realize it, it will be more expensive than if you uh, realize this uh, change at the beginning of the project. Um, this is a graphic for me who talk a lot. So I think that how I can uh, explain about the integrative design is show on this uh, graphic to understand what is important to put energy at the beginning of the uh, project. And this is one of the most challenge that we have to be able in our industry to realize project with this uh, real climate and uh, no, no climate, but this uh, real uh, uh, type of uh, environment of uh, collaboration. And when we create uh, uh, environment and, and uh, collaboration environment, and uh, we create a team work together with an integrative approach, we are able to we are able to, uh, we are able to have a new perspective of question. And what I like to uh, uh, mention is also how can we learn to optimize the resource and ask the good, the good question. We have an example is uh, that is a project uh, um, that I have realized. Uh, and in this project, we have put a lot of question to minimize the materials and the, the resource. And at the end of the project, is very interesting. So uh, I like to uh, explain like the clean design. We can realize a good concepts with uh, while limiting the quantity of material used. This is uh, one of the example um, that I like to mention because uh, with this uh, clean design uh, that we create in an integrative approach, we are able to uh, minimize our impact on the environmental um, and, and perspective and we are able to uh, minimize the budget for the client. So this is a good, uh, um, uh, this is a good uh, uh, approach and uh, is an example that I like to show. Yes, okay. You have uh, shown me a stop or? Uh... Yeah, we are a bit over time, but uh, oh, okay. just slowly to, to come. Okay, okay, sorry, but uh, um, uh, how many time I have to conclude? Like if you can do it in two, three minutes would be perfect. Okay, perfect. So uh, uh, for conclude, I just want to talk about let's the talk, the market. Um, uh, I will skip some uh, information that uh, maybe it's not uh, the most important, but uh, if we can, let's talk the market, it's sure that we can create opportunity. And this is what I want to say with you today. We are in a context of now we have a lot of uh, guide of 2D and uh, a lot of uh, document. We can give you a lot of number of statistic and uh, occasion to explain what is the good 
bottom pack of the green building. And at the end, we have also a new perspective about the zero carbon building program. So uh, you can uh, go on the website of uh, CHBC to learn more about the zero carbon building. This is um, a good uh, certification. They are more uh, on the market perspective and uh, they are clearly on uh, the point that I mentioned at the beginning of operation about the importance of talk about our carbon impact. So uh, this is a very good uh, approach that I like to mention and the Zero Carbon Building Program uh, are uh, a new uh, um, option to uh, cr create a building with uh, uh, less impact. And at the end, the importance of data and benchmark, just two reference that I like to mention, the GREBS and the ROLL Benchmark Alliance, they are very interesting information on this website and you can find a lot of information. Um, because you know, everything is just a balance, the creative tension, so we need to create balance with market and the urgency that we have about the uh, climate change. So um, this is uh, what I want to talk with you today. I hope that uh, you will understand the majority of my uh, presentation and uh, I hope that you appreciate it. Uh, so uh, thank you everyone. Thank you so much Louis-Philippe. It was fantastic and it Congratulations for the first English presentation. I even had to stop you because you were in such a flow. <laughs> so yes. thanks a lot uh, <laughs> for this. Um, it was a lot of um, very interesting insights. Like um, I think you, you 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 made a span from from the COVID and the impact, and it's like uh, we need to act now through the life cycle assessment and 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 more like um, I. I think it's it's quite a quite a big umbrella, um, and it shows like it's possible to make a change on many parts of the process at all. That uh, the process of development of the building, the process like uh, what is given by laws and regulations, the process of creating win-win situation financially, but as well for persons. Um, thanks a lot for this. Um, I just see that we have a first question immediately from the uh, from the online community, and uh, Navid was asking, "What about electrical trading? Are you active in that part as well, or is it just heating network?" I think it refers to this uh, project you were showing with exchanging loads and uh, heat and cold network. Yes. Um when you create an energy loop you are able to also to create uh, electricity exchange uh, between uh, building it's sure that in our experience in quebec with the reality of uh, electricity that we have with hydro quebec it's more difficult but i know that in other region uh, they are also able to create some uh, opportunity with uh, electricity uh, exchange so the the, the two uh, the two um, the two points uh, are able to live uh, together in a project for sure. Are there more questions? May it be as well from panelists or? Yeah, I have a, yes, I have a question. Thank you very much, Louis, Philip. I mean, I, I would agree with everything you said. It sounded all great, so it's really perfect. What I, I would like to ask is, um, is the solution of um, bringing the stakeholders together and the teams together at an early stage, basically changing the process, making it more collaborative and integrated design. Is that all it needs to realize these ambitious goals? I mean, that, that sounded a bit like, like your main conclusion that you, as long as you, and, and I got the same from Natalie. I mean, if, if you manage the process much better than in traditional, in the traditional way, you seem to solve most of the problems. But I don't know, I find it a bit optimistic. I mean, that that all, all the sort of financial issues. Um, yes, maybe I'm a little uh, optimist about that. But uh, in the same time, for me, it's maybe one of the biggest problems that it will be the most difficult to uh, at, uh, realize because isn't this this is a part of our mindset and the majority of people in the industry are not able or are not ready to make this change of mindset 
And this is very difficult to work with the mindset of people. So uh, we have a lot of work in front of you to be able to uh, make this change of mindset. And people are not able to realize uh, the uh, advantage. Uh, they are not uh, able to see the economic um, uh, perspective that they are uh, uh, positive for the, their project because they are always uh, uh, with the old reflection and the old uh, statistic that they keep and they want and they don't want to uh, consider the new uh, number and the new statistic that we have to explain to the, these people. So, yes, this on paper this is easy this this is just an approach a problem but this is maybe the most difficult that we can uh, change in the same time can i ask one more technical question when you talked about these um, loops are you i mean where you basically extract or feed in heat um, are you always talking about low temperature loops i mean like more or less 15, 20 degree Celsius temperature, and then you need decentral heat pumps in every building. So could you explain the system a bit more? Yes. Um, for the, the, the project that we have realized uh, in uh, the east of Montreal, in Technopole and Gus, um, we have uh, some uh, some uh, some units on each building and when the building create over uh, heat or over cool cooling we are able to uh, exchange the the with the uh, gly the glycol or refrigerant <laughs> fluid in the other building to uh, maximize the exchange with the other building Okay, so it's a low temperature loop. Yes, yes, it's a low temperature. And with this low temperature, when the building is create to oh, uh, more uh, energy and more uh, heating uh, than he needs. So with this uh, loop and this uh, cold temperature, we, we can take put the, the this over in the building near from it. But it's, there's no geothermal involved. It's just exchange between the buildings. Yes, it's, it's, it's really an exchange approach between buildings. Okay. Interesting. I, I'm afraid probably at, at Lachine, probably the use is not so mixed that we have so much excess heat. There we're talking about a geothermal loop, but it's a bit the same idea, but, but yeah. You would need more commercial or industrial use to, to generate all this waste heat. Yeah. Are there some more questions uh, from the audience or from, from other panelists? Like I have to say, we have as well at the end of the conversation uh, still a kind of a time for Q&A in a more like after you heard all the speakers that we can discuss about things. Um, it would be interesting to shift maybe some things there. Otherwise, like uh, if there's nothing anymore, I would just like uh, to continue and to introduce and welcome our next speaker, Erika Barbosa Vargas. I just share my screen. Welcome, Erika. Fantastic that you can be with us today. Um, Erika holds a bachelor degree from Concordia University and a master of public administration degree from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Today she is director of solutions finance at the McConnell Foundation. She oversees the management of the impact investment portfolio and the integration of environmental social governance criteria into foundations endowment fund. Erika will give us an overview about impact finance and draw a big picture of how it relates to real estate finance and finance that takes into consideration environmental and social outcomes. The floor is yours. Great, thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Let me just start this. Share. Um, okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. So um, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for the previous presentations. Very um, 
very enlightening for me and, and informative. Um, I'll give you, as, as Michael was saying, a, a broad overview of what impact investing is, and mostly from the perspective of um, from where I work, which is a, a foundation. Um, a little bit about uh, the McConnell Foundation. It's the second oldest uh, private family foundation in the country. And, uh, you know, foundations are typically known for their grants uh, and their charity uh, work. So we finance uh, charities and nonprofits across the country, McConnell in particular, over uh, a multiple uh, domains. We have a very big mission to support the, the development of innovative, inclusive, sustainable, and resilient communities in the country. So over the years, we we develop programs in specific areas. Uh, at the moment, we have priorities around transition to an equitable uh, net zero uh, carbon economy. Um, social inclusion, in particular, uh, uh, economic reconciliation. Community well-being, broadly defined and still under development in terms of a priority. And then we also support uh, the development of social innovation and social finance ecosystems in the country as tools to help us achieve broader uh, social and environmental objectives. Now, all that work and sort of like the charity side of the foundation is done with just about 4% of our total assets. 96% um, of our assets are managed as investments. So we're, we're, we're mostly uh, an institutional uh, investor. So from that lens, I'll bring you a little bit of perspective in terms of where things are at in terms of this notion of sustainable and, and impact finance. So um, the, the, the world of, of sort of like from a capital perspective, when we think about the mobilization of capital, um, from our perspective, we, we tend to think of it as being on a, on a spectrum, where on the sort of like far left, you have finance only. So that's typically when you're managing money, where you, all you care about is your financial returns without any consideration for your environmental social uh, impacts. On the other side of the spectrum, you have, you have the capital that is mobilized purely for a social and environmental good with no financial return. So that's typically where our uh, grants and subsidies uh, come into place or so certain public dollars. And then everything in the middle, in between that, um, there's sort of like various degrees is what's known as sustainable finance. And you'll hear um, uh, typically multiple terms, sustainable finance, solidarity finance, and now impact investing. It's all really part of a, of a same continuum. Um, I would say that the, the, the bulk of activity uh, globally uh, from by, by asset owners, so typically uh, pension funds, insurance companies, uh, governments, uh, foundations that are the ones that sort of like hold all the capital um, is, is mostly in what's known as responsible uh, investing. So uh, at the moment reported globally, there's about $30 uh, trillion that are managed uh, in a responsible, in some form of a responsible way. What this means is that um, as you make investments, uh, no matter in, in what public companies, private projects, infrastructure, et cetera, you're typically taking into consideration environmental, social, and governance factors. So what are your environmental impacts, uh, energy efficiency, uh, air and water pollution, work um, conditions for workers, uh, rights, uh, diversity of your staff, uh, board diversity, separation of powers between board and management, and those kinds of things. Um, now, even those considerations in and of themselves are on a spectrum. Some are very passive, so um, uh, what, what are known as exclusions. So us as investors might say, you know what, we don't want to invest in fossil fuels, so we'll exclude fossil fuels from our portfolios. Uh, in our case at McConnell, we don't invest in um, uh, tobacco, alcohol, adult entertainment, uh, private correctional facilities, and we have a few other, other screens. Um, other other uh, forms of what is known as ESG for the environmental, social, and governance uh, factors are more related to, you no, know, we actually want to invest in companies that are also creating some good. Uh, for the most part, uh, investors do exclusions. That's sort of like easy, but you're not really changing anything in the world. Uh, the latest evolution, uh, you're just, sorry, um, you're, you're, you're sort of like cleaning your portfolios, but you're not really generating more change. 
Um, that's what um, the latest evolution in this market is about, which is what's known as impact finance or impact investing. So it's really the more proactive approach to investing where you're really looking to, in addition to generating a, a financial return, you're also looking to have a positive impact on social uh, envi or environmental uh, issues. Uh, so it's really about mobilizing capital to solve environmental and social problems and to scale solutions. Um, who uh, participates in this, um, in this ecosystem? everybody really it's this is not sort of like the the, the whole idea is that we look at, at entire communities uh, all sorts of enterprises from technology enterprises public companies nonprofits uh, generally the, the the on the on the demand side you have all sorts of activities in terms of an economy um, you also have investors every type of investors from uh, institutional ones uh, financial institutions are also sort of like contributing in one way, maybe not intentionally yet, uh, but are part of what would be an impact uh, economy. You have a whole range of service providers at the moment. And, and the idea is that we start to sort of like the movement behind impact investing is to be able to get to an ecosystem whereby communities are all contributing to the development of social progress, environmental sustainability, as well as uh, sustainable and regenerative uh, uh, economies. We're addressing sustainable development goals, and then we're, we're obviously taking care of pe uh, people and the planet, which are the primary input into, in, into our economies and our ecosystems. Um, at McConnell, uh, at, at the foundation, we've been doing impact investing for quite a, a, a few years now, about uh, 10 years into this activity. Um, when you look at, uh, just going back to this uh, definition, within impact investing, you have two categories. And typically people think, well, if, if I if I do invest for impact, am I sacrificing financial returns? And the, the answer to, to that concern is, Sometimes, not always, you have both two different types of investments within impact. You can be investing in certain sectors or certain areas where you're creating more impact at the, uh, by taking a lower financial return. You can also make uh, uh, competitive financial returns by creating uh, uh, social and environmental impact. At the foundation, we have the two types of investments. And I'm just giving you these definitions not to, to make things more confusing, just because some of my graphs have the PRI versus MRI uh, distinction. So uh, our program investments are investments where our primary motivation as investors is to generate social and environmental impact with some uh, financial return, but we have we can take more risk, we, tend to, we can take lower uh, rates of return. So typically here we would mobilize, we would use our balance sheets and our assets to uh, provide guarantees so that, for example, charities and nonprofits can access financing. So they use uh, our balance sheets as collateral to access financing by, um, by financial institutions. Uh, or uh, we also invest in funds that uh, are providing loans to charities and nonprofits. And typically our, our, our rates of return are going to be a little bit lower. We also have uh, investments that give us quite competitive uh, financial returns, and it all depends on the maturity of the market, the types of enterprises or projects. So here we have investments in um, uh, renewal funds. It's a BC-based uh, fund that invests in, in, in sustainable for-profit companies, so B Corps, uh, many of them. Uh, and uh, they're, they're providing sustainable products and services uh, in the market. We also have an investment in BlackRock, which is the largest asset manager in the world. And they, for example, in our impact portfolio, we're, we're in a fund that is entirely solar and wind uh, power. Uh, so that falls under our, our category of, of impact investing. Um, when we look at our portfolio as a whole, and this is representative of many foundations and how they're managed and increasingly how some of the pension funds are, are managed, uh, we currently have about 13% of our assets in impact investing, and then the rest is in some form of responsible investing. So the screens that I was telling you about that we do not in tobacco, alcohol, and a few other things. Uh, we also do um, shareholder engagement uh, through some of our portfolios. So this means we as investors, 
um, are take a sort of like an activist approach with 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 senior management of companies so that companies can actually improve on their policies and practices reduce their environmental impacts etc so um, you know, there's we, uh, for instance, we've uh, in some of our portfolios, we are not, uh, we're not an institution that is yet entirely out of fossil fuels, but uh, there we do a lot of engagement with uh, some 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 extractive companies uh, be on issues not only related to environment, but for example, their relationship to indigenous communities and how how they engage with these communities to be able to uh, share resources, engage them in projects, etc., in the in the communities where they operate. Um, people think that um, many times there's this notion that this is still a very small uh, market. Um, we have about 25 investments that are considered impact investments across a range of domains. Um, this was data from 2019, $65 million invested from McConnell. Our we don't invest directly in product, pro uh, projects or companies. We invest through funds that then invest in projects and companies. So combined, all the funds that we're in, when we were invested $65 million, they have about $2.1 billion in assets under management. And I share this just to give you a sense of like, th this is only in Canada and we're just one little player with very few investments. There's many more than this. So it's actually a quite robust and, and, and growing, uh, growing market. Uh, when people ask us, well, what about your, what types of asset classes and what types of projects? Um, we're a little bit in everything. So we invest in public companies and real estate and infrastructure. Uh, we pro we're in fixed income. So uh, lending uh, for, for project development, more later stage. We also invest in equity that typically go is the first tranche of financing in different projects. Um, but, uh, and our returns are also quite, uh, quite varied. Uh, Natalie was mentioning at the beginning the types of returns that, um, that investors expect. Us, for example, we, we have a tolerance for, uh, or appetite for a lower uh, rate of return for, um, for, for environmental and social impact. The challenge that we have is that one, we don't invest directly in, pro in projects and we don't have the, 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 the managers or the funds that are investing in multiple projects like the one we were, we were being um, uh, shown. And the other challenge is that even though we have the appetite, we don't have the scale. Um, are still like even $650 million that needs to be invested across a range of different types of projects. We end up putting 1 million in one fund, another million in another fund when sometimes projects are much more than that. So we can't take the whole, uh, the whole financing. So we need, we need partners. Um, investors uh, that care about impact investing, obviously we care about uh, metrics and about the impact uh, side of things. So uh, for instance, uh, this is a typical breakdown of a portfolio that we would have um, for, for us. So one of the things that we look at is by sector, what are the different sectors in, in, in which our impact investments are, are, are invested. Uh, the more, one of the more mature um, domains is energy and the environment, so primarily renewable energy. Um, uh, sustainable food and agriculture, we support young entrepreneurs. Uh, some health, uh, innovation, affordable housing, and financial inclusion. Uh, we also look at demographics and sort of like who are the founders, who are the entrepreneurs that are leading some of these, some of these projects or the ultimate beneficiaries. And uh, increasing, and our projects that just to give you a sense, we're invested in funds in Canada, but the projects that then they are financing are a little bit across all of North America and some very few in uh, Europe uh, as well. Uh, we, this is just sort of like illustrative of the things that we look at. So for example, in housing, we're very interested in not only the number of affordable housing units that are created, but then also the types of tenants or uh, homeowners that are part of, uh, that are part of uh, the, the uh, that have access to these units. Um, in sustainable food systems, we're in, in uh, farmland. Uh, we, we participate in a fund called Area One Farms, where the, their entire mandate is to buy farmland and then uh, not the typical model of, 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 of purchase and then rent, but rather they share 
some of the profits with the farmers so that they can build the equity of farmers and then the farmer families are able to purchase back those farmlands and to help maintain farmland in the in, in the hands of um, of families in Canada as opposed to it going to just large companies. In the case of real estate and infrastructure, increasingly what we're looking at is both not only uh, environmental factors, but also social factors. Uh, we recently did a, did a search, uh, we were trying to sort of like do a reallocation of our, of our real estate uh, investments. We did an open request for proposal for funds uh, and sort of like put as the criteria environmental uh, sustainability as well as social sustainability. Um, we got very few uh, results back, but we actually found some some very interesting funds. It was both a it was both a surprise in terms of not having more than two three funds worldwide that could give us this combined criteria of social and environmental uh, impacts. But at the same time, we did get more than twenty five funds that have strong sustainability components uh, and interest to it, which just was, um, and this was for our endowment management, so very mainstream where we're looking commercial rates of return. Uh, it, it, it at the same time shows that there's increasing activity. Um, in this space. Um, I was mentioning that, um, you know, we by ourselves um, and most institutions, even if they're interested in this space, we have a lot of restrictions in terms of how we can invest our funds. We cannot go into projects alone, et cetera. So that's where we typically collaborate uh, with others, not only from a risk perspective, but because it, 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 that, that starts to help us. Um, you know, traditionally financial institutions are very risk averse and they're going to have their traditional uh, rates and they don't want to go into spaces that they have no, um, they're not very used to uh, financing. Um, that one, one, one example uh, of that is uh, the um, uh, um, home ownership in indigenous communities on, on reserves where because of land, um, land management and, and, and them not being able to use land as collateral, uh, financial institutions typically do not provide any type of lending services to individuals in, 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 in unreserved communities. And so one of the projects that we, that we were involved in with a community out of uh, Quebec City, the Wendat Huron uh, community, they had actually taken savings from the community and started to provide mortgage lending themselves to their, to their community members and developed an entire housing market in that community. To, uh, in order to scale that, we, we had some capital, but we didn't have sufficient capital. So what we did is we said, okay, let's partner with the government. And by us taking a little bit more of risk or not taking as much financial return, we were able to bring in a financial institution that provided the bulk of the capital to be able to finance a, a prototype of, um, uh, it was a $2 million fund to, to prototype some, some uh, home development. But the whole point was, let's get some of these mainstream players that don't like to operate in the space uh, in by us. Um, and that's the type of collaboration or partnership that we can start to think about and that we need more of uh, to be able to drive capital more into this, uh, these types of uh, projects. Um, so this, this type of sort of like combination of capital, different types of players is what's known as blended finance. So it's something that is quite known in the international development uh, community. So typically aid agencies like Global Affairs Canada and other multilateral agencies um, uh, uh, collaborate with the with the IFC from the World Bank and other financial institutions precisely to be able to attract private investments that looks for commercial rates of return. They combine it with concessionary capital and then you have this blended structures that then provide the capital that is needed on, on the ground. Um, we have less of this type of, uh, of, of structure in, in sort of applied to the development of our communities no matter what domain internally here and domestically. So this is the type of thing that I think most of us are having the reflection as institutions of how can we actually start to create a bit more of these, of, of, of these examples. And it's a little bit of chicken and an egg uh, situation because then at the same time, we need projects that we can look at as examples um, to be then be able to create the financing structures to be able to respond to a demand and not just sort of like create structures where then we're gonna be able to pull money and we're not gonna find sufficient projects. But then as 
you were talking about at the beginning, you also need the financing to start the project. So it, I think we, what we need to work on is just creating more spaces and some of these conversations where some of this innovation and innovative uh, collaborations can take place. Uh, but we're starting to see that the entry of new players in our market, we might have a conversation about that in a later presentation that maybe can help accelerate <clears throat> these kinds of conversations. Uh, I put here Guarantee Solidaire as an example, because this again, um, here, for instance, this is a partnership between foundations and La Caisse d'Economie Solidaire, which is financial institution. And what we do is we offer our assets as guarantee, as collateral, and then they're able to go and provide additional, more financing to social enterprises on the ground uh, in a whole range of, uh, of, of areas from real estate development to uh, working capital for, for, for a food nonprofit or, or other types of social services. Um, in our portfolio, this is just to, again, to give you a little bit more of an example uh, of um, uh, different types of, we have multiple different types of funds and the way that we really think about sustainable cities and, 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 and impact investing is, is sort of, is very, very broad. So we have, we have funds that are invested in clean technologies for uh, energy efficiency. In buildings, uh, we have a project that is um, installing um, uh, geothermal uh, energy units in, in uh, indigenous communities on reserve. Um, we have affordable housing for uh, families, for uh, people with disabilities, and for students. We have the uh, indigenous housing market fund that I was mentioning before. Uh, we have uh, with BlackRock, we have two different funds. We have the, the solar and wind uh, energy um, 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 uh, fund. We also have another one that is not impact investing, but it's more on the responsible investing side where what they do is they look at, for instance, um, in health, what are some of the biggest uh, uh, health issues and, and, and disease threats in the world? And then when they're building their portfolios, they sort of like, they take the index of, of, of public companies and they look at the pharmaceuticals and which ones are putting most R&D uh, into, into addressing some of those um, uh, health issues the most. So more money goes into those companies that can have an impact uh, uh, at the health level. Also selecting companies that have uh, the strongest em employee policies and, and those types of things. Um, at the project level, we're in very few, as I was mentioning, now we only invest through funds, but we provided a guarantee for the construction of uh, the Maison de Développement Durable here in Montreal. And uh, we're an equity partner with uh, Nathalie's company uh, at uh, Le Salon, who, which has been a sort of like a, a, a great example of a new form for us. Uh, mostly it's, it's more of a learning experience about how can we actually start to think about uh, the, 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 the maintenance of our civic assets in a way that also drives uh, the development of community and the creation of more cohesive communities. Um, all of these uh, funds and, 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 and companies underlying it are, if we look at it, are, are addressing multiple uh, sustainable development goals. And uh, yeah, where we're at is we're, we're looking to grow this. And again, I think one of the main challenges is institutional investors want to, to invest more sustainably. If you look at right now, if you take any, um, any headline from, from a financial uh, newspaper, you're gonna see that everybody's talking about the recovery and taking you know, climate, especially the climate crisis is one that is not being ignored by any investors. Uh, everybody wants to put their money there and help us uh, reach the Paris agreements and, 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 and other targets and objectives. It's more at the level of the intermediation and how do we create the financial mechanisms to reach those projects um, that where we need where we need further collaboration and where we need to be a little bit more creative because the the willingness of investors to deploy money is there, but they're not going to go there if if there are no no products in which they can they can invest. So I'm going to stop here. Um, usually there's more, there's more interesting uh, through a discussion or, or, or questions and uh, happy to answer any if there are. Thank you so much, Erica, for this huge kind of journey. <laughs> it was really great to see this uh, and, and to, to make the big picture for us to understand what impact financing 
um, means and uh, even I understood it. So um, like it really is meant to, to make an impact and it was like the numbers were just uh, wow. I mean, from 65 mm -hmm. millions to 2.1 billions, this is a huge jump, like um, fantastic. And I see as well the possibilities there behind and uh, it's as well nice that kind of to see that in the financial market it's with collaboration you can have the impact and it's not just a single kind of source but it's like meant to to join together forces to to have really an impact this was fascinating for me to see as this is a, as well a new world for me so i wonder are there questions from the panelists or from the audience are there some kind of like uh, urgent questions I have a question. Um, could you tell us a bit how the process work of works of, of screening for these kind of investments? I mean, does it rely sometimes on, on personal relations that you meet people or companies that you find interesting or, or do you do a more systematic search for them or how, how does the process work of finding um, good partners for such investments? Or, or, or do you just get approached directly and it's more on a personal level. That, that would be interesting to understand. So um, it, 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 if when we started this, the first few investments that we did in this space, um, so when we started to explore what, what did it mean to do impact investing, because for the longest time, we were doing all our good work in the world with 3.5% of our assets and then not even looking at how our investments were managed. And then when uh, in about uh, 2007 was our first uh, impact investment. So that was based on a relationship that we had with a, with a university. Actually, our first impact investment was a loan to a Quest University for infrastructure development. They had already been a, a grantee of, of McConnell at the time. And our investment in renewal funds in 2010 was also because a, uh, a board member, uh, the chair of our board actually knew the, the, the people in this fund and said, listen, this looks amazing. And it sounds like the foundation should be invested in this. There was a lot of reluctance from our investment committee at the time to look at this. It's like, what is this impact investing? Is it something new, et cetera? So they, it was actually our board that said, please go review it. If Unless there are red flags, uh, we want to we wanna try it out. And that's how it started. And then I was brought on uh, to the foundation to start to systematize a little bit more the activity and grow this space. Um, right now, it's we're, we're, we're in a place where we receive uh, constantly proposals um, and then it goes through a, a, a review process. The first thing that we look at is, is there a strategic fit both from a financial um, uh, uh, policy? Does it fit with our investment criteria, returns, assets that we can allocate money that are set by our investment committee? And from an impact standpoint, does this help us advance some of the priority areas in the different programs of the foundation? And if it's a yes to both of those, then we go into a full due diligence where we look at people, process, performance, and, and assess the quality of the funds and, and, and everything else. And then it goes to our to our committees for 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 approval and to our board. Um, the, the, I was mentioning the search that we did. That's something that we've just started now with the intention to actually grow our allocation to impact. We do uh, open uh, through consultants uh, externally. You can do sort of like a search for uh, fund managers where you put as an investor the criteria that you're looking for in terms of financial returns and then some of the impact criteria. You say, please go and source. And typically that, that goes through databases of asset managers that say post sort of like the criteria and that you get responses of who has open funds, et cetera. Um, it's a little bit different from institution to institution. Um, Foundations typically do not manage, most of them do not manage the investment themselves. We rely on external managers. Pension funds, it's slightly different. They use fund managers and they also manage their investors. So you can, you'll can you see, at least in Quebec, there's a bit more participation in, in real estate development, et cetera, Fond Action, uh, FTQ, and some of those players, but it's, it's less, um, less the case for foundations that rely on external expertise to do this. Okay, are there some other questions? Nope. Okay, since we are 
a bit over time uh, because of all the <laughs> impressive input and I don't want to stop because it's just really so thrilling. Um, I guess I will switch now to Erkan Yender and introduce our next speaker and I guess uh, everyone can think about questions and ask them later on. So um, I will share and I want to welcome uh, Erkan Yender. He's an assistant professor as well in Concordia and he holds a bachelor, a master and a PhD degree in economics from the Middle East Technical University in Ankara and a PhD degree in finance from the Maastricht University. Today he's, as I mentioned, assistant professor of finance and real estate in the John Moulton School of Business and a Laurentian bank professor in real estate finance. The title of his presentation is Financing Costs and Financial Benefits of Investing in Green Buildings. So Erkan, floor is yours. Thanks, Michael. Uh, first, let me share my screen. Um, so, share this. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I think uh, I should close this up, right? So yeah. I think it's fine. Okay, perfect. So, um, uh, thank you, Michael. I mean, Ursula, this is like I like I was thinking about how my presentation would fit into uh, the the group of speakers. But I think it's perfect. So this is a perfect program, and I think uh, like my presentation is very complementary to uh, to the other uh, presenters. Uh, so I'm Mark Yondar. I'm I'm a professor at John Molson School of Business. So I mean, I do various uh, research on various topics, but of course, um, I mean, climate is really at the core of my research. And actually, green buildings. I started to work on green buildings since the start of my PhD. Uh, so it's been like more than 10 years since, since I'm, uh, in, uh, I've been into this. Um, so like what I will present today is like a series of research, which I, I've mostly uh, been involved. Um, so I will discuss the economic and finance literature on, on green buildings uh, at the academic side. And, uh, like, let, let me start with an anecdote. I think that that would be uh, very interesting. So I, I took some notes uh, from other speakers. Uh, I think it was around 2010 or 11. So we were organizing a conference uh, on green buildings. So there were papers or academic projects on, on green buildings, sustainability, especially in real estate. And I like we had a couple of speakers and an investor, a developer raised his hand and said, okay, you are talking about all of these things, but will I make money? I mean, like that's that's a very important question, and I think uh, we've heard about these things uh, in the previous presentation. Like, for instance, I like Natalie's work on on profit now, so that's the main uh, intuition and motivation by by the investors. So I hope my presentation will help change this motivation. So okay, I mean, this is uh, like impact investing, but on the other hand, you can make money or you can make profits out of this. So this is more about uh, our research. So, and pointing to, to Ursula's uh, question, I think we can be optimistic at the same time as well. But of course, maybe the investors should hear more about these, these outcomes uh, more frequently. Okay, so let me start with like this. This is a very general uh, slide for uh, in our field, for people working in, in green buildings and the financial or economic benefits of green buildings. Uh, if you think about the, the impact of buildings on, on the environment, uh, like 30-40% of global greenhouse gas emissions uh, are emitted by buildings. More than 70% of electricity consumption is, is by uh, buildings. And like it, it makes 30% of operating exp expenses, 10% of total housing costs. So it has a huge impact. Okay, So if we uh, want to contribute to the environment, Buildings are considered to be to be the largest potential contributor to to environmental efficiency. Okay, so okay, on one hand there are profits, but on the other hand, if you want to uh, make an impact or if you want to improve the, the climate or uh, respond to climate change, then buildings are at the core of uh, this, this topic. So there, there have been some solid, uh, policy responses to, uh, to the impact of buildings and also environment. Um, one important thing is, of course, the cap and trade. Uh, I don't know whether you are aware of cap and trade, but I can give you an example from Europe. So the, the European Union puts allowances to different types of businesses, and you can also construct buildings here. So in one type of business, 
assume that the, the government allows 100 units of carbon emissions and for another one, 80 units of carbon emissions. And then they give allowances to this. So let's say the 100 one, uh, let's say emitted 80 units by some improvements in, in their um, environmental efficiency. So they can sell those 20 units to the ones who emit more than they should. So this way, there's a price of these allowances. And if you, uh, if you become, or if your company, or if your building becomes more efficient, then you can make profits out of this based on the price of the carbon emissions, or the ones who are over emitting uh, should have to pay a fee or a price uh, to emit more than, uh, than they're allowed. So this is one way. Uh, the other way is that like the, the governments can put stricter building codes, uh, especially for new buildings. It's more difficult for older buildings. I'll, I'll talk uh, about it a little bit more. Um, but for, for the buildings, the governments can put stricter building codes. But of course, uh, there are problems with um, budget issues. So fiscal tight belting constraints, these subsidies, and, and these supports by, uh, by the government. So alternatively, we have voluntary labels. Okay, which comes to uh, lead and energy star. So lead is very common. I mean, you know about lead. And in the US, I mean, most of the studies that we are into right now uh, are uh, in the US market. So there's lead and energy star in the US. I'm not going into details, but if I talk about energy star, the way energy star rates buildings is that, I mean, they kind of calculate the energy efficiency of a conventional building, uh, similar to the target building. And then they make a comparison and Relative to the conventional building, they check the energy efficiency of, of the target building and then they give a score from zero to 100. Uh, so it's really about energy efficiency for energy star. Lead is a little bit different than that. So lead has different categories, um, like for instance, the green areas, walkability. I mean, these are very important uh, characteristics for lead, like the building design. So they have six components of sustainability and they, they rate this way. So in, in this research or in this, let's say, bunch series of research, uh, most of the research really relies on, on these labels, okay? So if a building is energy star labeled or if a building is lead uh, labeled, I and mean, we kind of assume that there's a certain level of sustainability uh, in these buildings, okay? So, and, and then uh, the research goes on, on the economic consequences of, of these labels uh, in the real estate markets. Uh, I really like this slide. This slide is really related to, to the previous discussions as well. Uh, I mean, this is kind of old. So this compares, uh, this gives a survey comparing 2008 responses to 2012 responses, but I think this is very important. Like if you look at, for instance, lower operating costs, uh, it was the main motivation in 2008. And when it comes to 2012, uh, the motivation for going for green buildings based on lower operating costs, uh, it went down. Uh, so this is more about kind of making profits or decreasing the costs of, of the buildings, operating the buildings. And then if you look at right thing to do, uh, it was 26% of the respondents in 2008, but this raised to 42% uh, in 2012. So that's, that's the main thing. So first of all, if you are talking about uh, environmental uh, investments, I mean, if, if the investor thinks that this is the right thing to do, or this is the impactful uh, type of business, then they will be more into this type of business, okay? So then profits can be, I mean, they can give up some of the profits or, or, or I mean, uh, they can motivate themselves to invest in such uh, properties if they think that is the right thing to do. And we see such a movement from 2008 to 2012, and I think it's still out there. And, and um, Erika actually talked about institutional investors, and I also know that they are very into uh, environmental impact of, of investments. So I think this is a good uh, kind of introduction and connection to, to the other uh, presenters. So what we have done, uh, so I I mean, since my PhD, I've been working with a research group uh, from Maastricht University. Um, we are still working on, on various topics. Um, I also have other projects um, out of the group. Actually, Pete Eiholz and Liz Koch are the, the founders of GRESP. Uh, Liv Lip was talking about uh, GRESP. So they are the founders of GRESP. So like this, I'll start with the first project and this is like a top three economics publication. And I think this is the, the first paper opening the literature in, in economics and finance about uh, green buildings. Uh, everything started with this one. I was a little bit late. Uh, I came in into the team uh, a few years later, uh, but this is the start of the project. So what they did in this project, they look into, the, into office buildings from the US 
and they have transaction data about these buildings. So they have the transaction price of the buildings and they have the rental uh, income for, for these buildings. They cross-sectionally compare certified buildings to non-certified buildings. And then they try to find whether there is a premium or there is any, there any additional premium or profits for labeled buildings compared to their conventional building peers. Okay, so this is the core. I, I don't want to bore you with the analytical stuff, so I didn't put the tables with numbers and stuff, but I'll give you a taste of, of, of the research that we are doing. So this is an example building. So this is an energy certified and lead gold certified building uh, from San Francisco. And what they do in general in, in the research design is that they uh, label, they check the property uh, with a label and they draw a circle around the, the property and they compare the certified property with the non-certified properties in, uh, in the circle, in the neighborhood. So the idea here is that uh, like the labeled buildings are in general high quality buildings, so they should already have higher prices or maybe better rents than regular buildings. But the idea here is that on net, controlling for any quality, any other things besides the, the environmental efficiency, they want to calculate the pure contribution of being certified relative to conventional buildings. And what they found in this research is that uh, they found that uh, certified buildings have two to 6% higher rental income uh, than conventional buildings. Uh, lead or energy star certified buildings have six to 8% more uh, higher effective rents. Effective rents mean that, um, mean that uh, this incorporates also the occupancy rate. Uh, so these buildings are more occupied uh, than non-certified, non-labeled green buildings, and they generate higher rents uh, in normal in dollar values, and they are sold 11 to 13 percent more than um, uh, regular buildings. So again, these numbers are net of any quality aspect. So you control for so that's about the econometric and statistical design of the research. So you control for every aspect of a quality, and on net. Being certified uh, increase the value and endurance. So if we want to convert this into uh, dollar values, for instance, an average non-green building in the rental sample would be worth $5.6 million more if it were converted to, to green in, in this uh, sample period. Okay. Uh, so this is like a follow-up. As I said, this is we have a large group of uh, researchers. So this is one another group's research. This is an ongoing research right now. So this is published recently, actually. Uh, and this is a report published by CBRE. So CBRE Research funds this uh, research. And what they want to do is that they compare the rental income of certified buildings to non-certified buildings, and they create an index based on the transactions that they have. OK, so if you look at the certified and compare certified and non-certified buildings in, in the graph, we see that there is a premium for certified buildings over non-certified buildings and it is stable. So the premium doesn't change much and it's, it stays there. So we are talking about a 20% difference, uh, maybe a little bit less than 10 to 15% difference uh, between the two indices. So the solid line is for the certified uh, buildings and the dashed line is for non-certified. So this is for asking grants. Uh, this is for occupancy. So they have more than 20% more occupancy than, so green buildings have more than 20% occupancy than non-green buildings. And this is combined, okay? So this is effective rents combining the occupancy of the building and, uh, and the uh, asking rents. And then we see a large premium, which is going uh, stabilized. And I, that's something I think a lot about it because I mean, in economic terms, if you think that if all of the buildings are certified in a neighborhood, then there shouldn't be any premium, right? So this is more about also scarcity of these buildings. So you, there are so many non-certified or less energy efficient buildings, and then there are fewer uh, energy efficient buildings. So it's important that this is this is continuing. Okay. So this is also reflecting that this is not still not the standard in the in the market. Okay. So what does it uh, mean for for investors especially for real estate investors uh, so there are two sides uh, of the coin here one side is is the equity part so these companies uh, like if we are talking about property companies here uh, their core of investment activities is that they buy properties they rent them out and then they sell those properties so they have two sources of income 
One source is uh, through dividends, which is the rental income uh, for, for properties. And the second part is capital gains. And the capital gain is the increase in the price of, of the property. So at the asset level, at individual property level, we see that these buildings are sold at higher prices. These buildings generate, these labeled buildings generate higher rental income compared to conventional buildings. So what happens if companies invest, more invest in certified buildings relative to conventional buildings? Uh, what happens to their uh, financial outcomes? Uh, so this is where I joined the team and this is what I'm, I've been mostly looking into, especially for certified building uh, research. And the second part is the debt part, right? Because to invest in these properties, uh, they need capital uh, for, for these investments and they go to, to the debt markets. And then the question is that, how do they borrow for, for these properties? What is the cost of debt uh, when they invest in certified properties okay so that's the second part so there are three four papers that i'm involved in in this part also and i'll just summarize those and i mean if you have questions i can discuss more of course uh, so this is the first i mean there are two papers that I, i've worked on on this with the same group uh so in the first one that was during my phd uh we, we first showed the the uh, financial outcomes consequences uh for real estate investment trust these are the publicly traded property companies uh, globally and we look into the US market in this project. And I have a follow up paper, which is complementary to, to the uh, previous paper uh, recently. So, what we've done in this research is that, and it's very interesting, I, I'm still getting surprised, but it helped me a lot with my academic career. So, okay, these companies are publicly traded companies. So, they are regulated by, like in the US, they are regulated by ACC. So, they have to have certain uh, transparency. But it, Actually, it's not a uh, public. It's not public information that which all the properties that are owned by these companies are certified. So, I mean, they have to report what properties they invest, but they don't have to report whether these, uh, how many of these properties or which one of these properties are certified or not. So that's kind of a voluntary disclosure. So what we did in the first research and how I continued uh, uh, in the last decade, let's say. Uh, is that we first identified those green uh, properties that are owned by uh, those largest property companies in the US and also globally. And we kind of calculate the share of certified properties in the whole portfolio of the company. So, I mean, inverse, you can say that uh, this company has 10% certified buildings within its property portfolio, okay? Because these are kind of, these companies are holding uh, property portfolios and some of them are certified and some of them are, are not. So we use this share of uh, certified buildings as, uh, as a measure of sustainability, and we call it as uh, portfolio greenness. And then what we did was we related this portfolio greenness to, uh, to the financial performance of the company. So if there's a larger share, what we ex expect is that there should be uh, more better uh, financial, corporate financial performance. And it's a dynamic measure, right? From one year to another, for instance, they can buy or invest in a certified building and then they can sell an uncertified building, which increases the shares, which is a dynamic measure uh, by time also. So this is the, the figure from the most recent paper. I mean, we updated the dates until 2014-15. Uh, I mean, maybe I'll update it uh, sooner i don't know uh right now all of the research is is based on uh until 2015 in this field uh so this is the share of uh so this is the million square footage of certified lead certified buildings so lead has different levels of certifications so we see so it goes from certified silver gold to platinum and then we see that most shares are in maybe gold uh certified buildings so we see an increase starting from 2000 I mean, they start to own in 2005. Uh, and then after 2008, we see a large increase. And it went down, it goes up. So it's kind of fluctuating right now. But it's not a very big share, I can tell you. So I think it's around 10 to 15% of, of uh, the US uh, REIT uh, property portfolios. Uh, so this is for LEED and this is for Energy Star. So they have more Energy Star certified buildings in the US. And this time we categorized by um, the, the unit score. So they, they can get scores from zero to 100. And if a property has a score above 70, then that property is certified by Energy Star. So that's the logic of Energy Star. So there are more shares 
uh, by energy star and that's the evolution uh, of uh, green property ownership by, by property companies in the US. So what we have found in this research, again, at the asset level, uh, it's documented that they, these properties, certified properties generate uh, higher rental income, they have higher transaction prices, uh, but how does it reflect, uh, is it reflected into uh, the, the companies investing in these properties uh, financial performance? Um, so in, in the first research, we look into return on asset, return on equity, funds from operations, which is like available cash flows to uh, shareholders. And we find in all of these operating performance measures, companies uh, uh, performance increases by more ownership of, of certified buildings. Interestingly, we find that uh, portfolio greenness decreases the market risk. So we look into the market beta of, of their stocks which reflects the exposure to the global markets, to, to the stock markets. And we find that companies, if companies own more green properties, their exposure to, uh, to, the, uh, to the global market or to the stock markets goes down. So their bet beta decreases by, by increasing their uh, ownership of green properties. I mean, this can be explained in different ways. I mean, we put two explanations and more into this one. Uh, possibly this is due to the sustainable returns of, of green properties. I mean, um, I had to cut because of, of the time limit some parts of my presentation. Uh, but I mean, in general, these properties we, we've seen, uh, they have higher occupancy rates, for instance, right? So this decreases the risk of individual assets, um, which maybe is reflected into the, the market beta of, of these companies. And the second paper, uh, I was very into this for after the, the first paper. I mean, it took some years to, uh, to write the second paper. So in principle or in, in, in theory, companies can benefit from green properties in, in two channels, right? One channel is through the asset level, to, through the property level. We know that these properties generate uh, higher rental income and they have higher values. So in the end, companies should have better cash flows, but they could also benefit at corporate level. So like, for instance, if I like, I think McConnell is a good example here, right? If one company is uh, into more sustainable property investments, these companies can attract institutional investors like McConnell into, McConnell into their uh, assets. So which means that beyond the cash flow benefits of these buildings, they can attract more investors into their companies. Uh, which increases the, uh, or which creates some additional benefits at the corporate level. I mean, we kind of related to the, to the corporate image. So they can improve their corporate image and they can attract more investors into, into their companies. Uh, and I mean, it's too specific in finance. We look into net asset value, which is a very unique measure for, uh, for property companies. Uh, and we kind of decompose the two effects. So first we show that these companies have better cash flows like better rental income, better net operating income. They have lower interest expenses, again, lower betas. But on the other hand, we look into on top of these benefits, are there any additional benefits at, uh, at corporate level? And we kind of documented this uh, in this paper. So this is in the process of publication right now. This is the only paper which has not been published academically at the moment. And also in this paper, we did one thing additional. Uh, and we divided into different property types. So we, we look into the shares of green buildings when it comes to green offices, when it comes to retail offices, and when it comes to residential, uh, green residential properties. And each one of them works separately. So actually it doesn't matter. Industrial is weaker because there are less certified buildings for industrial properties, actually. Uh, but it really companies benefit uh, for if they invest in green offices, green retail properties and green residential properties. Like uh, I started to teach at Concordia um, since the last two years, for the last two years. And like, for instance, I had speakers from the retail market and I see that they are not aware of the benefits of green buildings, for instance. I mean, this is the first project which documents the benefits for retail profit, uh, properties also. So still the market is not aware of, of the benefits that they can get from environmental efficiency or, or green labeling actually. One additional note about these, uh, uh, these papers is that uh, these measures are net, net of cost. So, okay, the first paper which looks into the rental income was the first paper and it was maybe published in one of the top uh, economic journals. Uh, 
Uh, but the, there, there was a problem about that paper, which is that it doesn't incorporate the, the cost of, of, of the properties, like the operating expenses and other things. So it was just pure rents. But if you look at from the corporate perspective, all of the operating income measures are net of uh, cost as well. So this research also proves that uh, companies benefit from investing in certified buildings net of any cost that they generate. Uh, and then the second part is the, the cost of debt. Okay, so at the uh, outcome part, let's say, uh, we find that they, they have better uh, financial performance, but what about the, uh, the borrowing part when they invest? They need to use mortgages and be looking, looking to bigger companies so they can also issue bonds. So what, what happens to, uh, to the uh, cost of debt? So the interest rate of, uh, of the mortgages, culturalizing uh, certified properties versus culturalizing uh, non-certified properties. Or what happens to the interest rate of bonds if the company is greener than otherwise, okay? Uh, so this was the first paper looking into this. And I think this was one of the first papers also looking into broader finance literature. So, I mean, we use the, uh, we use the green aspect. Um, so, and we use the real estate market here. So overall, what you find is that, uh, so we look into the uh, mortgage spreads by looking into individual properties uh, that are purchased by, uh, again, US REITs, the, the public real estate uh, companies in the US. Um, and overall, we find that if, if a company uh, invests in a green property and borrows for a mortgage, the spread has like 24, 29, uh, basis points less interest rate than conventional buildings. And this translates into a reduction of $150,000 or $200,000 less payment in the annual uh, interest. Uh, we find larger impacts for gold and platinum properties. So if the certification level is larger, actually the impact almost uh, doubles or triples. Uh, and importantly, I don't go into those details. Uh, importantly, we control for property characteristics, right? So these are net effects. So these are not related to any quality aspects. Like for instance, I think that's a good indicator. We used um, an S&P 500 tenant indicator for each property. So if a property has a uh, S&P 500 tenant uh, um, uh, for the property, if the company has a, an S&P 500 tenant for the property, uh it doesn't affect our results because i mean i know I'm, I'm coming from turkey as well i know from the turkish market at the same time that uh, like if these green buildings attract better tenants and maybe they can get lower interest rates by their uh, tenant base uh, but this is the impact that we find is net of this this impact as well uh, we also look into uh, bond spreads in the secondary markets and we find that um, if companies own more green properties, they have lower bond spreads in the secondary market uh, that are traded, okay? So this is like the, the whole bunch of research uh, on, on the topic. Uh, so I was curious about whether I had time for these two last slides because this is kind of something new that I'm, I'm working on, but I think I can talk about it for a minute, I guess, Michael, right? So this is a very neat project. Um, so the, the academic literature, I mean, as you, you've seen, well documented the, the financial benefits of certified buildings. But of course, as we've seen in the previous presentations that like investors are also interested in the direct impacts because the labels are kind of, okay, they are checking all of the aspects and these, these labels guarantee certain level of sustainability. But we wanted to look into more details, especially uh, if an investor invests in a property company's stock uh, public listed property company stock, how they can contribute to environmental, social, and governance activities. So we look into European public real estate companies in this project. It was a joint project with European Public Real Estate Association representing uh, most of the public companies in across Europe. And first we uh, determined the categories based on company reportings. And companies actually reduce environmental impact by trying to decrease their carbon emissions, trying to decrease their water consumption and trying to decrease their uh, waste generation. And we try to look into social contributions as well. Like we look into employee, employee training activities and community donations. Actually, Eka gave me some great ideas uh, about how the social impact can be measured. Like for instance, 
uh, Erika's point about the tenant types is very important, but we don't have information about it. But I think uh, the, the institutional investors are requiring more about the, the social contributions of property investments as well. So it was great to hear from Erika at the same time. Uh, so we determine these categories and then we developed a model like we use some machine learning technology with details. So this is just a small part. I just wanted to give you a taste about what we've done uh, in this project. So we try to, I mean, the idea like for instance, Grasp is doing benchmarking, right? Grasp gives scores to the companies. Uh, like you can see the score and you can compare one company to, to the another uh, but we wanted to, and EPRA and our research team, I mean, we really wanted to quantify these benchmarkings. So in the end, investors invest dollars or euros in these companies. And what is the outcome? So if I invest $1, how much of that $1 goes to uh, environmental impacts or social impacts? So we tried to quantify this. Like we did also some benchmarking. Um, like I'm not going into those details, but on average, what we found is that, and like European property company and EPRA is really pushing companies to, uh, to, to decrease the environmental impact uh, for their members. And on average, we found that a company, an average European public listed company, if you invest in them, they kind of contribute in a year by four or 5 million euros to, to carbon emissions by decreasing the carbon impact of, of their companies. I think this number is very interesting and I think a direct comparison could be uh, community donations because with community donations, we observe the dollar value or euro value directly. And in those, like for instance, on average, a European company invests like or donates 500,000 euros and you can contribute to carbon dec decreasing carbon emission by four or five million euros if you invest in, in this company. So this is just, and then we have some relative statistics. So this is just a taste about uh, what we've done. So this is kind of a new research going on as well. Thank you, Michael. Thanks a lot, Erkan. It was super interesting to see like uh, what happens to like companies who invest in green buildings in different kind of labels and how and what impact this has. And um, are there questions from the audience or from the panelists? I can always ask a question. <laughs> I mean, there seems to be a, a clear correlation on um, improving benefits for investors on, on these certified green buildings. So the question is, how does that um, translate back to the um, borrowing capabilities of a real of a real estate investor. I mean, it seems to me that often it's still difficult to, for for real estate investors who want to do these green buildings to get the financing. So uh, although the research shows it's um, there's a there's a benefit on on the long run, but it doesn't seem to translate in sort of banking in sort of the low end um, banking loan policies. Can you comment on this? So, I mean, there are direct, of course, approaches. Like I can give you an example from Turkey. When I was working in Turkey after my PhD, uh, there was a World Bank initiative. So they wanted to fund certified buildings in Turkey and they were giving cheaper uh, financing to, to the Turkish banks uh, to finance certified property. So there could be such things like there are lots of funds, green funds out there. But I think our research is mostly dependent on maybe the, the financial benefits. In the end, these lenders evaluate the properties, the cash flows of the properties. I think our research is a reflection of that. These properties are less riskier uh, than conventional buildings. And somehow they are capitalized in, um, in, in the interest rates uh, by, by the lenders. But of course, that could be special like there's so many companies. I mean, there's, I think, uh, Carbon Trust in the UK. I mean, there are different companies, in, uh, financial institutions who are specifically funding certified uh, buildings. But also what, as I said, I think our research reflects the, the higher quality of these buildings or less riskiness of, of these buildings. One additional note is, of course, green bonds. Uh, I mean, I had to cut my presentation, but I know some examples from Europe or, or the US, for instance, like there are some green bonds. So company issues a green bond promising that with the borrowing, they will invest in certified buildings. And in the, in the green bond contract, they put the conditions 
So they say they invest this, they consider this environmentally, they will certify the building. And then these green bonds also have cheaper uh, cost of that relative to regular bonds. And we didn't check which of those bonds that we cover uh, have been uh, green bonds in our sample. So maybe some of them are green bonds, uh, but overall we see it in, in the market. So my explanation is more about that these properties are less riskier because they can attract better tenants, that's for sure. I mean, uh, I want to want know in, in Turkey, for instance, that like if a global company wants to open a headquarter in Istanbul, uh, they were looking for green buildings. I mean, they don't choose conventional buildings in general, so they can attract better tenants, which is kind of capitalized in, in the debt markets as well. Can I just do a follow-up question, if that would be okay? Um, usually our experience is that these type of buildings are institutional buildings, so institutional investors who um, choose to spend more, like an Ivanhoe Cambridge or that kind of a situation. But the general aspect is if we're trying to get to 2030 and our environmental goals for these kind of buildings. Unfortunately, so far, it's been our experience in the city of Montreal that tenants are not yet willing to pay more for this type of a building. So I think that some of your numbers, um, I would be great to be able to see how that affects Montreal. And then a second follow-up question, which might be more of a debate than a question, is um, the higher rights and the higher quality tenants um, doesn't bring it back down to affordable offices and being able to have um, environmental equity uh, for different kinds of groups. So um, whereas a tenant will, you know, that's a higher quality tenant, which uh, possibly has international investment, will pay those additional rates. But then it comes back down to, again, um, shouldn't it be, um, a larger scale um, because only a couple of buildings have been able to do that even though that there is an increase which I think is great and there's just not enough financing yet around and even if you look at the amazing work that McConnell is doing if you look at their loan guarantees as an example it's 1.2 million dollars um, if you look at the type of buildings a typical commercial building for office space as an example in Montreal won't go less than 20 million or 25 million um, so that money um, really helps out nonprofit groups. And I think it's amazing to do that. Um, but unfortunately, we haven't yet seen the scale that is needed um, to trickle down to more buildings, which will then be more accessible. But I do agree that we have international companies that come to our buildings and want to be in our buildings because we are environmentally um, more respectful. And, and it goes back to their investor portfolios back at home, as an example. But I don't think Montreal is there yet. I want it to be there, but we're not there yet. I mean, just a short comment. That's definitely correct. So this is like, uh, I mean, of course, this research kind of concentrates on, on the US market because they have better data in general than any other market globally. Um, of course, this should be kind of like I can give you an example from the certified like this, uh, the impact of certification on the transaction price, for instance. I mean, after the first paper for the US, I mean, that project has been replicated for the UK, Japan, Germany, like, I mean, of course, this like this should be expanded and different markets can have different aspects at the same time. That's definitely correct. Yeah, thanks a lot for this uh, great comment. And uh, as we have as well Swiss persons with us, I feel really bad because they are normally fantastic in time. But um, like it's it's a pleasure for me to introduce now um, two persons who will make together a nice presentation. And I think it, it really fits very good uh, to your presentation, um, Erkan. So on the one hand, it's uh, welcome, Laura Canasta Costa. Uh, she holds a bachelor degree uh, of the London School of Economics and Political Science, a master's degree of public policy from the Hertie School of Governance in Germany, and a master of public administration degree from the Paris Institute of Political Studies. She was lecturer in several institutions, and today she is sustainable finance policy manager at the Credit Suisse in Zurich, Switzerland. She will to do the presentation together with uh, Tobias Popovic. A colleague of Ursula and mine from University of Applied Sciences in Stuttgart. Tobias holds a master and a PhD degree in economics from the EBS Business School in Österreich-Winkel. 
Today, he's a professor of general business administration, in particular corporate and sustainable finance, financial markets and services, and CSR at University of Applied Sciences in Stuttgart. Since 2010, he has been the ethics officer, and uh, he was also the sustainability officer at the university. Their presentation is about sustainable infrastructure finance, and Tobias will start and draw the big picture, and Laura will complement this with case studies. Welcome, and the floor is yours, Tobias. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction and above all for the invitation. It's a great honor and a pleasure um, to participate in the seminar or webinar and to be able to give a short presentation on sustainable infrastructure finance in a next generation cities context. Um, I'm not quite sure if I'm already able to share my screen. Uh, maybe I need some more assistance from you, Michael. No, you should be. Should, should work. Okay, then just one second. Yeah, now it seems to be working. Yeah, it works. All right, then I will go into the presentation mode. Yeah. So. Oh, you, you're in the sort of presenters mode. We see also your next slide. But okay. If that doesn't bother you. No, so it's not magic. It's OK. Uh, maybe I switch to the other screen. Maybe just one more uh, try. Tobias, I had the same problem. So you need to choose the second screen, and the presentation will be full screen there. Yeah, well, the same issue second. before. Yeah. Thanks. Just one second. One more try. Uh, right, then we'll choose this screen. Okay, does that look better? Perfect, perfect. Yeah. Okay, okay, sorry for, um, for that. Yeah, um, in my previous life, I used to be a banker. So um, I used to work for 10 years for the Central Bank of the German Cooperative Banks. And at the same time, I used to be a um, member of the board of the um, Central Bank for the Spanish Cooperative Bank. So it was right during the real estate crisis and the financial markets crisis um, in 2007, 2008. So the learning curve was quite steep. After that, I um, moved on um, to academia once again. and. Um, Use, uh, I've been working now as a professor, like Michael said, for corporate sustainable finance. And together with um, Ursula and um, Michael, we've been doing a couple of um, research projects. So I was the finance guy in that project. And um, most of the projects were related to the European energy transition. And for example, one, um, one research project, we developed a green bond concept um, for the, our state of Baden-Württemberg for refurbishing public buildings. And currently, right now, I'm involved in more or less um, six um, research projects, um, third party funded that all kind of relate to sustainable finance. And I've been doing some for the last 10 years, basically, that was my um, key research area, sustainable finance. Um, since I didn't know um, how much knowledge the participants have on sustainable finance, I um, chose to um, draw the bigger picture um, because I didn't know how much um, extra knowledge um, there is in this group. Um, and therefore, I just jump right into. So you, I, I guess you're all familiar with the World Economic Forum in Davos, which takes place every year. In the Swiss mountains at the beginning or at the end of January, and um, at the beginning of this World Economic Forum, um, they publish every time the so called global risk report. And this in this year's report, for the first time in the history of the World Economic Forum, and as well um, as the global risk report, um, they all the top five risks for the next 10 years um, were related to climate change in one way or the other, directly or indirectly. And so that's, I mean, that's not uh, the General Assembly of Greenpeace. So it's the General Assembly of the world business and political leaders. And so that um, 
maybe shows um, the urgency in what we are in as a global community and um, that's real time to act. Um, now, this is just one, climate change is just one, um, let's say, grand challenge. There are a lot of other grand challenges, like, for example, urbanization, digitization. Then in, in Europe, we still have a big debt um, challenge, public debt challenge. Um, but I think the same is true for most countries in the world. Then we have trends like urbanization. And um, the trouble with these challenges is that they all come at the same time so that creates some kind of complexity because they are also interconnected and um, some people say that some kind of VUCA environment so volatility uncertainty complexity ambiguity and uh, especially political leaders but also business leaders are having a hard time and finding orientation so they are seeking for purpose for purpose um, maybe guides um, the direction to that uh, or makes makes it a bit clear, a bit clearer where to to move to, and so one purpose might be like the um, Nobel Prize winner Albert Schweitzer. He was also a theolog theologist, great philosopher. Wrote in his book um, Culture and Ethics, reverence for life would be a purpose. The trouble with this purpose is that it's um, rather abstract and not very tangible. But um, in my opinion, the good news is the, the um, UN's SDGs um, provide a means to, ma to make this purpose more tangible and also more measurable, for example. And so uh, the purpose might be a good starting point, but in the end, um, the bottom line results count. And um, we could call it impact in terms of the triple bottom line um, dimensions like economic, environmental, and social impact. And that's, of course, um, maybe one issue um, next generation cities um, should be aiming at, namely um, making um, positive contributions to the SDGs in these three dimensions. To um, link it with a bigger picture, uh, maybe we make a short history back in time um, or a time voyage back to the year 1944, um, where the economist Karl Polanyi wrote about the negative side effects of capitalism and he called his book the great transformation and that was much very very much focusing on negative side effects of capitalism um, 67 years later the um, um, advi german advisory board uh, an advisory council to the german government on global change they choose not by accident the same title namely um, great transformation but what they were aiming at is a different kind of transformation, namely um, transforming our economic system in a more sustainable, into a more sustainable economic system. And the key element or one key, key element of that is um, decarbonization. And of course, that comes as a cost, the cost and especially social costs uh, play a big role there. There are unfortunately a couple of, of barriers um, we need to, need to get over, but um, in addition, there are also favorable fa factors. And I think the last presentation um, make it very clear that, um, for example, refurbishing buildings, um, using um, green building certificates and other technologies related um, show that most projects in the area of energy transition or in the building sector, as well as the infrastructure sector are financially viable. Also, we have a, a move um, towards changing values, public values towards sustainability. So just think of the fight for future movement. So that provides for tailwinds and um, um, also helps um, to increase the decarbonization level over time. And now the question is how can we use these tailwinds? So innovation plays a very important part there. So we call it transformation to innovation. And also one um, um, thesis might be that, in my opinion, the financial markets and the access to financial markets play a um, very important role. Why? Um, that's what we see on the next slide. Um, the, um, that's a study that was carried out by the United Nations by, by UNED FI. And so what they um, was some kind of meta-analysis and they gathered figures on the costs, the annual costs of 
um, refurbishing basically or investing in, inf in an infrastructure um, aiming at the two degrees scenario. So since we all know, we basically need to target at a 1.5 um, degree scenario, um, it becomes clear that the, the actual figure should be higher than the approximately 6 um, trillion we see here as investment needed. Um, and that is kind of, of, a, of a problem. Why? Because um, if we look at the public debt levels that have increased on average all over the world by 50% over the last 10 years, so be it on the federal level or be it on the municipal level, most um, public institutions and authorities do not have any more the money to do all these investments. And now the, the question is, um, how can, for example, um, financial markets contribute to that? And that's basically what um, Laura and I would like to um, point out a bit more in our presentation here. And for example, two years ago, the OECD, the um, United Nations and the World Bank in a joint call um, called for a radical shift um, in, um, in investments in um, infrastructure. And um, they also pointed out that how that might work, but um, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, in a book chapter that was published two years ago, I tried to highlight that sustainable finance actually might serve as a catalyst um, for this great transformation towards a more sustainable economy. And so the question is now, what basically do we understand when we talk about sustainable finance? So basically in, in a broad definition and in general terms, sustainable finance is basically all about accessing financial markets in order to fund activities that are related to sustainable development and more particularly um, for activities that make a positive contribution to the SDGs. On the UN level, for example, the United, United FE talks in, or writes in that context about positive impact finance. Um, that's a more or less a similar direction. And now the, the, the key challenge is how to, to tap financial markets. So, for example, in the area of sustainable infrastructure finance, we, we need more instruments, we need more financial products that can be offered um, to, fi, uh, to financial institutions. And that, of course, relates um, to other um, areas of sustainable finance, like new energy finance or clean tech finance. And um, that's just a selection of, of areas related to sustainable finance, uh, the list. Um, could, be, could go on basically for other areas as well. And the question is now how to, first of all, attract um, financial institutions, investors, and secondly, by which means, so that means basically by what instruments do they already exist or um, do we have to do some more research and development? And basically um, on these areas, that's where most of our research projects, it's HFT, um, are, are currently working on. The good news is, and um, I think that became clear also by the previous two presentations, is that sustainable investments um, is, a, is um, a source of funding in that area. And um, here we, we see strong growth. For example, what we see here is for, for Europe. And if we compare the figure of um, 2002 with what we see here, 2015, so that was is the broad definition of um, sustainable investment that was a growth of 5,400%. So could look like a bubble, but um, my opinion is, or my impression that it's not a bubble because um, we are currently experiencing on the first, on the one hand side, a carbon bubble. And on the, on the other hand side, um, we, um, are experiencing also from the regular, regulatory point of view, a lot of tailwind. The next slide just provides some more um, figures on other areas of the world, for example, Canada, United States, Australia, Japan. Um, and if you look at the growth rates there for the last um, couple of years, um, growth is um, quite strong in, in sustainable investments. 
but of course, um, to be honest, it's um, a very low starting base still. So in proportion to the overall SNL management worldwide, it's the same investment is still um, a very small proportion. But nevertheless, um, I think the direction is important and that provides, in my opinion, for hope. And especially, um, for example, BlackRock was mentioned earlier as the biggest fund asset manager in the world, currently like with 6,000 um, billion, so 6 trillion um, asset management. So that's quite a lot. And they at least committed themselves publicly um, to um, pursuing a more, um, or by changing the investment decision process overall, um, making ESG criteria an integral part. And um, since they start moving, others um, are following. And that's, in my opinion, um, providing for tailwind. Then I've I'm not quite sure whether you heard of what's going on or what's been going on in Europe for the last two years. Um, the European Commission jointly with the European Parliament um, started an initiative they called European Action Plan for Financing Sustainable Growth. And um, that's from the regulatory side. And they have a couple of this um, action plan contains like 10 different work packages. And um, the ambition is to get uh, within the next five, two years all these packages into binding laws for all European member, member states. And on the right hand side, we see the um, three core objectives of this action plan. And at the top, um, uh, that's probably the most important um, objective. Um, it's about reorienting capital flows towards sustainable investments. So that means rechanneling money from unsustainable, in this case, infrastructure and sustainable um, infrastructure or from unsustainable business models and sustainable um, business models and using financial markets as a lever for that, as a, some kind of catalyst. And as you can see on this um, slide, so it's affecting basically, it's affecting every financial institutions. And in Europe, it's the banks, it's insurance companies, it's um, investment funds, it's also the rating agencies. So that's also a very interesting discussion right now going on how they have to change the rating systems. Investment advisors and um, for our context here at the bottom also, sustainable investment projects, for example, in the area of, um, of infrastructure. And to sum it up, um, so that's basically, at least from a European foreign point of view, where the, the journey is heading us currently. So as a starting point, we have the grand challenges. We try to tackle them with the SDGs. Hopefully that will lead us um, to a more sustainable economic system um, over the next, let's say, five years. And um, so the action plan maybe might, might be serving as a game changer in that respect. And, and that will um, also, for example, if the, the capital flows are rechanneled, that will also change the strategies of publicly listed companies. That's for sure, but also for um, SMEs because they are affected by um, if they apply for a new loan or for a prolongation of a loan, um, they will also have to make clear and more transparent that they are more sustainable than they used to be, for example, that the carbon footprint is lower. And um, the starting point for all for this entire process was the EU CSR directive, which was launched uh, five years ago. And now we have the action plan. And um, at the end of last year, we had um, the European Green Investment, uh, the Green Deal Investment Plan, uh, which is also heading towards the same direction, um, providing public money um, in a concept like blended finance that we heard earlier, um, and use public money in order to attract more private money via financial markets. And now all the uh, Corona Recovery Plan. Um, measures that are underway are also linked to sustainability related measures. So um, when I started doing research and for 10 years ago um, with sustainable finance, I was 
considered from from my mainstream colleagues some kind of esoteric um, crazy guy and i never would have expected um, to to that we would experience so much um, tailwinds from a regulatory and political side and now um, um, if the EU continues in that direction, um, basically sustainable finance and CSR might become mainstream. Last but not least, um, just one example of our um, research projects. That's a research project, a EU, um, EU funded research projects with a funding of 19 million. It's um, involving 26 partners all across Europe. And um, the key objective is to make district heating networks uh, uh, basically um, feasible in a smart cities or a next generation cities context using waste heat. That's the primary objective. And um, the, the task I'm working on, and or I will be working on for the next three years, um, is basically to make um, DHC networks basically an asset class, first of all. Secondly, to um, develop financial instruments that um, make it easier for investors to, to, to invest in this new asset class, hopefully. And lastly, um, to attract um, institutional investors, um, especially, for example, insurance companies, pension funds, trusts, and so on. Okay, and before I directly hand over to Laura Canyas da Costa, um, every, everything we, we, we are discussing today um, is, was recently published um, three, three weeks ago in a new article or a book chapter in the book you see on the left hand side. And um, of course, there are more details to, um, to what we discussed today. Uh, but of course, you do not have to read all that because the most of it. Um, is contained in our presentation today as well. All right, then thank you very much. And then I would lead uh, or hand over directly to Laura. Thank you very much. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes. Okay. I think Tobias, you have to stop sharing before I can start sharing. Okay. Um, just a moment. Okay, is that working? Yes. Great. Um, okay, so I want to take, um, so sorry, first of all, <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here, of course. I'm over, my brain is already working on full speed, so I should um, say thank you, first of all, for the opportunity to uh, to share some thoughts with you today um, and to join you all. So I, what I want to try to do, hopefully in the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes to leave some time for questions is to take it from this macro sustainable finance policy to actually talking about infrastructure. Um, and uh, yes, I think, yeah, Tobias already mentioned um, the large funding gap with regards to infrastructure and in particular sustainable infrastructure. So I'm not going to repeat that. I mean, the, the numbers that McKinsey predicts um, are so high that I don't even know how many zeros they have, but we're talking about 90 um, trillion US dollars in the next decade. And now it's almost 2021, so, um, so not that much time left. And the big question is how can um, investors and financial institutions make a contribution and increasingly shift their portfolios from a conventional orientation towards a more sustainable orientation of their infrastructure portfolios. Um, of course, we all know that infrastructure is um, a very important asset class. It has a so-called economic multiplier by which by investing a dollar in infrastructure, actually the the outcome in terms of um, what this does to GDP is is somewhat higher. The IMF calculates it some, somewhere around 1.1, 1.2. So um, the economic uh, importance of infrastructure spending is, is really important. And then, of course, it's linked to very directly linked to global sustainability agendas, as Tobias mentioned, with the reference to the SDGs. So infrastructure plays into a number of these agendas. Um, if you break it down where this infrastructure spending is actually most needed, um, these 3.3 trillion annually over the next decade, very clearly power and road, um, so transport infrastructure stands out as the subsectors 
that require most spending in order to um, to meet global sustainability agendas like the Paris Climate Agreement and the SDGs. Um, one other thing I think is always really important to keep in mind when we talk about infrastructure finance is and why these these decisions of where the money is spent today are so monumental is the so-called lock-in effect. So because of these really long um, life cycles that infrastructure tends to have from something like 20 years for, for a solar PV um, plant to up to 100 years in the case of a hydropower plant, um, we really not only not only does that infrastructure last, but in many cases the auxiliary infrastructure, the roads that lead to a plant, to a plant, um, all all of the 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 infrastructure that is associated with that is also going to likely outlast the infrastructure. And on this slide, you can see um, what that means um, a few decades or even centuries down the line, um, where you have a yeah a comparison of Atlanta and Barcelona with very similar. Um, population and wealth levels, yet as you can see a completely different layout. This is largely because Atlanta was built on the assumption of, you know, low energy prices and a lot of space um, and and it's very difficult now, um, you know, so many decades later to to change the basic layout of the city. So the infrastructure we spending that happens today is going to lock us in for the foreseeable future. Why do investors care about whether their infrastructure portfolios are sustainable or unsustainable? I think um, in the second, um, in, in the previous and, and previous to that presentation, we already heard quite a bit about that. Um, I tried to summarize um, why from the interest of an investor or a bank, um, this, these are, this is not just a nice to have, it's not as a target to be a set, but it's actually um, mani can manifest in real dollar terms. and. These are the six main um, risks uh, I would say uh, you can identify. The first one, of course, being the physical risk. Um, infrastructure that is not built with a view to, you know, um, what extreme weather events will impact it over the lifetime face significant physical risks um, and, and potential damage. As Tobias just mentioned very nicely, actually, increasingly, infrastructure assets also face regulatory risks um, because regulators, supervisors are very much having a closer look at um, incentivizing sustainable assets and disincentivizing other ones. So if you think about the introduction of carbon pricing, um, this will potentially massively change the profitability of, of brown assets like, uh, like um, coal um, and so on. Related to that are market risks. So disruptions that are caused by, for example, new technology, um, something called stranded assets which is a result of of the of the first of the second and third so this i mean coal um oil and gas to an extent are now considered stranded assets by a lot of um by a lot of central banks and market participants because we expect these to um to to not have the same level of profitability and of course um just customer preference people being increasingly interested in sustainable mobility um heating their homes and um, using renewable sources of, of energy so this will this will change market dynamics and the profitability and then in the bottom category there are project delay risks which i will talk about in a moment so a lot of um, esg environmental social governance and um, characteristics of a project can have um, very real implications for yeah for how long whether a project can be built um, in its in its planned time frame. Um, oftentimes there are reputational risks associated with unsustainable infrastructure projects. If you think about um, the displacement um, when a new um, hydropower dam is built somewhere in the Amazon or in, in the Mekong uh, basin. This, this can have very real implication and related to all of that are liability risks. So um, companies or infrastructure companies uh, increasingly having to um, or are, are increasingly accountable for some of the pollution that they cause. Um, I'm thinking here of, of the, for example, the tragic uh, Vale incident, uh, the dam breaking in, um, in Brazil, um, but that's just the tip of the iceberg, of course, or an extreme example. So project delay risks, I wanted to quickly um, dive a bit deeper in um, because there was an interesting study done by the Inter-American Development Bank, IDB, which actually scanned its portfolio a couple of years ago. So they looked at all the infrastructure projects in their portfolio and um, found that environmental social governance concerns like social unrest um, were behind a very large share 
of project conflicts um, in and which in in 81 percent of the cases and uh, and and 58 percent of the cases respectively were the most common um, uh, conflict consequences and they found looking through these projects um, that the average delay uh, caused by such ESG concerns was five years, which, yeah, for an infrastructure project, of course, under construction is a, is a very um, is a very large and costly delay and related to that cost overruns of up to, um, sorry, of an average almost 70%. So, so as I said, this is not, um, not a nice to have to look at whether infrastructure portfolios are sustainable, but depending on context can have very real uh, financial implications. So, what are some of the things that an infrastructure investor could look to um, when they want to make their portfolios more sustainable? Um, as Tobias said, this, the, the, the end goal of where we want to get is sometimes a little bit uh, opaque and, and very little tangible. But one of the things that I find a really interesting development is, um, is the rise of third party um, market tools. So, I really appreciate the, the previous speaker um, going into so much depth about LEED um, because this of course has been around for a long time when it comes to, to buildings. But very interestingly, we've seen a, a, a very um, big increase in such labels and standard certifications being available or being under development for infrastructure also. So GRESP now has a, an infrastructure assessment tool um, and, uh, and so do some of the other providers. And this is then, of course, something that an infrastructure investor could potentially look to when they have two project proposals on their desk, um, trying to make sense of which one might be the more sustainable choice. Then, as as we as consumers sometimes in the supermarket look look for WWF labels, and similarly, in an ideal world, uh, an investor could do the same. And originally, a lot of these um, assessment frameworks were developed by development banks. So the most um, the most relevant example being the IFC um, performance standards, uh, which which are used um, by uh, well by a, a large number of development banks, but also by private investors um, today. And then in the last few years, um, we see some building standards kind of venturing more into the in the general infrastructure market, but then also some dedicated tools being developed, particularly for infrastructure, namely the the Shore standard, which I'll I'll talk about a little bit. So um, at WWF, um, WWF did a study um, back in 2019 on assessing and trying to compare. Um, so I, before joining Credit Suisse, I did I did work in WWF and was uh, and and um, participated in this in this review. Um, the major motivation for that was that all the investors and banks that we worked with, trying to convince them and finding strategies for how to make their portfolios more sustainable. Uh, most of these banks uh, and investors were just somewhat confused on how to tackle the sustainability issue and on a project by project level, how to distinguish sustainable from unsustainable and were somewhat confused by, by all these different standards. So we, we tried to um, try to distinguish them by, by their primary user types and also the types of assets that they, um, that they cover. And so this is what I'm, this is a, a slide with lots of information. I'm sorry about that. But the basic, what I basically want to show you here is that um, even though there are a large number of infrastructure certifications out there now, they really um, do very, very different things. Um, so they have different geographic focus areas. So um, you can see BREEAM SQL being a, a rather European tool. Um, the GRASP infrastructure standard and the SHORE standard attempting to be uh, have really global coverage. Um, Envision having a, a largely North American focus. So depending on how international the investor is or how global the, the exposure is, this will make a difference. Um, one important distinguishing factor also is whether these standards are ICL compliant. So ICL is sort of the certifier of the certifiers. Um, so it's an independent review process that that goes through how independently verified um, and how sound the methodology of these different uh, certification tools is. And, and at the moment, ICL, uh, the SURE standard 
is the only one with ICL approval. Also, not all standards are third party verified. So where they aren't, for example, in the case of, um, of, of the IFC performance standards, it's up to the individual financial institution or the project developer to make sure that they fulfill the criteria, which of, of course, much simpler, cheaper process, but also less robust. Um, and then sometimes they, they cover specific subsectors. And then the other thing I would like to highlight is that um, because these standards are relatively new, or a lot of them are, um, the level of their track record also varies um, quite significantly. And, uh, and GRASP certainly is um, the one with that, that has most track record with having annual assessments uh, since 2016. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll skip to this last slide. Um, so as you can imagine, with, uh, with the different levels of rigor, global coverage, um, and whether or not they are thir third party verified, um, we found that there is really a, uh, a fundamental trade off um, between how rigorous and detailed the standard is. And of course, the advantages of that being that an investor really by having um, a very rigorous um, assessment of a project on their desk can, can really have a very detailed um, view of, of where, from a sustainability perspective, the strengths and weaknesses of a project are. Unfortunately, the downside of that, of course, being that typically the uptake of these kinds of certifications is very limited. So it's difficult to find a project and it's very unlikely you know, that, that the market will, will see a significant uptake because these, these certifications and are, are complex and pricey. Um, and and uh, yeah, that being the downside. And here you can see a little bit of an attempt to um, put to to rank these different standards um, according to the the level of of rigor um, and depth of assessment, but also according to the level of the, the potential of them um, being aggregated and uh, finding widespread uptake. So I would say, yeah, GRASP probably strikes um, a really good balance um, with regards to having some rigor but at the same time still seeing some some significant uptake uh, versus something like the shore standard um, so to sum up there is a significant infrastructure funding gap um, in order to reach global sustainability agendas especially we need to ramp up investment into sustainable infrastructure um, combining this with this lock-in effect that I discussed um, means that we absolutely, as investors, as financial institutions, and, and ultimately all of us need to focus on, on making sure the right infrastructure gets built um, today. And for sustainable infrastructure does pose uh, material risks in many cases to investors uh, in the first place, but by, by extension also to governments and to communities. And um, well, or you can turn that around and say com to communities uh, first and foremost in many instances, of course. Uh, so third party various certifications are one of the ways in which financial institutions can mitigate these risks. Um, and then, yeah, I showed some ways in which an, an investor could differentiate and make sense of this universe of, of, of certifications. And uh, that's it from my side. Happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Laura and Tobias as well. These were really great insights from the big picture to down. Like I was kind of shocked from this lock in effect and you call it, I think, stranded assets. Like uh, to see really as we are like working on the next generation cities to see like uh, what impact will have all these kind of stranded assets and that we kind of waste our futures or the gen like what we leave for next generations as well is quite hard and um the delay in construction so like uh, wow okay um are there some questions i know we are running all the morning and persons get like hungry most probably but i guess it's just fantastic uh, to see and to have these uh, great speakers around and um, are there questions from the audience as well? Like there were pretty few questions only from the audience, from the online audience. Otherwise, I encourage the panelists to, to share insights and to. I have a very simple question to, to Laura. I mean, who pays for the certification? Is that the financial institutions or, yeah? Really good question. Um, not so simple, actually. 
in most cases, most of the independent tools, let me just go back to this one. Most of the independent tools are more, um, are more being used by project um, developers in the design phase because they tend to be very complex. Um, they tend to be, yeah, more or they cater more to um, to those institutions that are in the in the planning and design phase. And the question is the extent. So they would pay um, typically and then hope to be able to pass on that cost to an investor, which would be willing to pay a premium because they can essentially outsource their environmental impact assessment. Um, so I would say that's the simple answer, uh, hoping to to pass that cost co that cost on and, and market them at a higher price. Mm. The extent to which that works, I mean, in the building space, we kind of as and we've also heard, right? We we kind of know that that certified buildings um, do tend to sell, um, but the experience just isn't there for infrastructure yet. Yeah. Um, I have another question, like um, Tobias was outlining, like how much kind of um, regulation like from governments or so on are really like of preparing the ground. Like, um, is it like that you can say that uh, only the government regulations have the kind of strength or the, can give the ultimate push to move? Uh, to make it possible to develop such a things like I mean now with the COVID uh, like uh, this you outlined Tobias with the COVID financing or the, the new green deal things like that I mean they will have an impact and before it was like the self-regulatory uh, kind of forces are kind of not strong enough is this right when I say it like this? Um, Tobias do you want to go first? <laughs> was, it, was it directed at me? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I, I consider it also or perceive it as a rather complex question, um, hinting at um, quite a couple of different aspects. Um, I, I can try to. <laughs> I can make a try. Um, so I, I'm not a friend of too much regulation, but for example, the financial crisis of 2009, 2010 showed that, for example, the financial industry, on a worldwide basis, uh, was not regulated enough. Um, unfortunately, most regulators um, didn't find um, intelligent answers to regulating the financial industry. So what happened uh, as has happened over the last 10 years in regulation was, in my opinion, not uh, quite clever in most areas. Um, just for example, hinting at the cooperative sector in uh, cooperative banks in, in France and um, for example, Germany or other European countries, they were the ones who survived the crisis uh, without um, public subsidies. But now they, um, by, for example, regulation, um, they are punished um, for something they, they haven't committed, basically. And But now, um, in the case of the European um, Action Plan, I, I was positively surprised because um, when some colleagues of mine and I, we were um, last year involved in the um, call for commons process of the European Commission. And when I looked at the taxonomy and other work packages, I was surprised because my impression was that it seems to open up room for innovation um, um, for different kinds of industries, for example, or economic sectors. So. Now, the key question is how the European Commission will actually implement it. So that's the, the, the key question. And they can do it intelligently and also the member states, but they can also do it in a not very intelligent way. And then I, I would be afraid that the negative um, aspects would outweigh the positive aspects. Um, and maybe one further aspect, looking at the German energy transition, um, that was also very much done in a very regulated way, in a very strict way, and it made the entire project very costly. And one thing um, I just only briefly was able to hint at in my, my um, um, summary slide um, was the issue of carbon taxes. And for example, if you look at um, UK, um, how they are doing the, the energy transitions, they are just raising the taxes and the um, 
utility companies they are um, shifting automatically according to the to the market prices um, to, to the new market prices including the carbon taxes they are shifting automatically now from fossil fuels um, to renewables and it doesn't first of all it's it doesn't contain so much regulation. Secondly, uh, it doesn't um, cost the taxpayer as much money as it did in, in Germany. So I hope that it provides some answer to your question. Um, in my opinion, the, the key issue is um, that the implementation process will be carried out intelligently. Laura, so, you Laura. wanted to, to add something? Like uh, you were very like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Now I'm reconsidering my answer. <laughs> no, I think <laughs> okay. in the case of infrastructure, it's very difficult to do um, because you don't have the the retail investor or the, or the or the customer so so closely. So I think um, and infrastructure and and governments being so intertwined, I think it's difficult to do this without the regulator. But speaking from the perspective now of a of of a financial institution, which is kind of my my day to day, I think it's really difficult to strike the right balance between um prescriptive rules which then often tend to actually discourage investment right boxing boxing in um and at the at the same time still making sure that financial institutions move in the right direction and put their money in a way that that is sustainable and i think that's that's a really difficult balance to strike the eu at the moment is going more for very prescriptive rules um through this eu taxonomy for example really classifying what can be called green and, and what cannot be called green in future. Um, but I think it's important to, um, I mean, in order to get 90% of European companies to shift their, uh, how they spend their money and to shift their business model in a more sustainable way, you need to give them some, you know, some room to actually, to actually do that. And I think it's, it's important to, some, to incentivize them and uh, and giving them some flexibility while still making sure that they all ultimately move in them in the more green direction things it's very very difficult to find the right balance yeah it's it's like i was just like my my question was a bit uh like maybe on a very high level but i think um it's as well like uh, speaking concrete in the place like we are dealing with the lachine east project it's it's one part of of montreal and um the building industry here um, has some habits, most probably as everywhere. Like it's not the most um, innovative industry. It uh, like it's there is good money to to make, and um, so it's the question of like against money against building quality, and mm -hmm. if there needs to be some kind of regulations, for example, to say. Um, like you're not allowed to you need to have efficiency classes or you need to prove that uh, the building material you're applying is just healthy and does not contain some toxins yeah. or things like that um, because otherwise like persons are just continuing to go ahead and go ahead and nothing will change and uh, it doesn't matter if there's maybe a green deal so yeah. i wonder like it's i think a different level of regulation uh, i was kind of appointing to but um, I agree, like it, it needs to be differentiated. Yeah. I think ideally, sorry, I think ideally the, the regulation should somehow force companies to show that they're on the right trajectory, trajectory, right? Defining today, if you use glass X, Y, Z or something is not necessarily ho helpful to, to classify companies or activities in a really static way. Um, and I always think cement and uh, steel in a way are really fascinating examples where the majorities of company are, are hugely environmentally jam damaging, of course, but there are some, you know, some bright stars which are actually making the the investment um, in in trying to do things in a in a way that's different. So saying cement companies are on our brown or black list, that's that's that shuts companies which are actually in the process of transitioning um, from funding and somehow targeting regulation in a way that you incentivize those companies which are willing enabled to make that effort um, is, is going to be really important if we want to, you know, achieve the goals in the European Green Deal. Thanks a lot. Um, I think we have still one more speaker and uh, there is as well a time limit. Um, so uh, thanks a lot, Tobias and Laura, once more. Sorry for the delay to Switzerland. And um, 
especially to Switzerland. And uh, I would like uh, to introduce um, now Marie Claude Bourgil. Give me a second. Yes, I can share my screen. So it's well, sorry to you, Marie Claude, for the delay, but I hope it was an uh, insightful uh, morning as well in this case. So, um, welcome. Marie Claude Bourgie holds a bachelor's degree from Bishop's University, a Master of Arts degree from the Simon Fraser University, and an MBA degree from Concordia University. She was working for several companies and a non profit organization, always in the field of climate finance. Today, she's executive director at the Climate Fund of Greater Montreal. She will present impact finance activities of the Climate Fund of Greater Montreal. Thank you so much for your patience and fantastic to have you with us. Hey, well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me and please don't apologize for the delay. This conversation was extremely useful and very, very interesting. I feel we could talk about this all day. So um, I will share my screen with you. And um, so what I'd like to do uh, is bring the conversation um, Am I in screen mode? Okay. So I, I'd like to loop back the conversation because we went to a very specific project in, in Lachine here in Montreal to now, and we moved towards a very academic model, research, and then we went very macro in terms of the financial sector at a, a very high level. So I think it'd be interesting to loop back the conversation and bring it back to um, from a, a bit more of an operational lens because I think the conversation is extremely interesting to see uh, the, the, the momentum we have in impact finance, sustainable finance, and see these big pension funds and these big banks involved. But at the end of the day, how do projects developer access this money? And, and it's a question that we have to ask ourselves. And that's at the end, ultimately, that's the, the interesting question if we want to loop it back to the, the project is, and I understand that many of you on the line are engineers, so that's probably, where, where the, the interest lies. So um, I'm the, the currently the executive director of the Greater Montreal Climate Fund. You've probably never heard of the Greater Montreal Climate Fund. It's a brand new initiative. Um, we've recently uh, not, not even officially launched it. We're still in, in the strategic reflection and um, we're looking at the ecosystem in Montreal to see how we will be the most impactful. But uh, this conversation was extremely useful uh, for me to, to inform my, the strategy. So um, basically, uh, without us launching um, officially, and as, as you see, the, the presentation is not even branded. We don't even have a logo yet. So we, we still have a good idea of where, where we want to be in the ecosystem and what will be our role. So essentially, the broader mission is that we want to invest in low carbon solution in the greater Montreal area. And our, our real mission is to use our funding to be a catalyst to bring these solutions to scale. The problem is so big that any initiative needs to go to scale to make sense to, to reach our, our, um, our objective. They're ambitious, but I think we could do it if, if we have scale in mind. So uh, our mission is to scale up solution, is to influence policies because scale goes through policies. A lot of theories around how to scale uh, talks a lot about how ultimately it has to end up in a policy and we develop capacity because also if you talk about scale, it's a trend, it, these are transversal issues and you need community engagement, you need every stakeholder in, involved in change and that goes through capacity. So how do we do that? Um, we will be investing, um, we will be providing grants and we will build partnerships and programs. So right now the fund is financed through a $30 million endowment fund provided by the federal government. And we'll be looking at more financiers to, to help us um, increase the endowment and co-invest with us. Um, as, as Erica mentioned a bit earlier today, uh, an organization, the McConnell Foundation, they have extremely uh, uh, very good technical skills and a big capacity to invest, but ultimately they do not do direct investment they grow through funds like, like us. So if you look at the change of investing, this would be a, a, a practical perspective on what the type of investment uh, uh, an organization like McConnell could invest in to then uh, translate into direct, direct investment at the project level. So our vision is to have a greater Montreal carbon neutral by 2050. And obviously we can't do this alone. So 
this is a very, very quick, uh, absolutely not exhaustive um, ecosystem of the climate change in Montreal. And, and please really take it just as a framework because it's not exhaustive, but it, it's to demonstrate you that there are various actors that make the, these changes possible and make the, these, uh, whether it's infrastructure or behavior change or technology, what makes it possible, you need all these different actors, right? So obviously you need funders, um, you need environmental groups and community network because scale will only go through community engagement. So the, these networks um, of people gathering together in different, uh, priority area, whether it's transport, whether it's energy, whether it's agriculture or um, waste management, you need the, these environmental groups that create these networks. You need consultants, you need academia, think tanks to bring the, the technology and, and the, the theory and, and these practices forward. And obviously you need project developers. And what I wanted to, to get to is that an, organizational, an organization can claim multiple roles, but um, ultimately, change is not possible without all these actors and with all these actors acting together. So the Greater Montreal Fund, what we wanna do is use our funding to create cohesiveness and, and, and try to activate the best leverage and the best levers to really bring these solutions to scale by bringing all these different actors together and finding the right funding solution for each, uh, each actor. So, um, Basically, and, and I went uh, a bit layman's terms because uh, I didn't know what, what uh, people's level of financing, but uh, which, uh, which turns out to be great because I have only 10 minutes to present, so we'll, we'll stick it to the, the basics. So um, how do you access this climate financing that we've been talking about? Like, it, it's, it's very interesting to, to look into this, but there are very specific criteria of, of what, how a project can qualify. And a question was asked to, to Erica how she filters these initiatives, but there's certain things that you need to look into a project that are very basic. So when engineers or, or developers are thinking into their project, they have to make sure that these pillars are in place. So first of all, you need impact, obviously. Um, and, and the impact nowadays, we're, we're more sophisticated in, in our, our metrics and our, and our approach. And we realize that being too focused on one impact, if you have a project that is solely focused on reducing green gas emission, you might be creating uh, per perverse effects on other sectors. So now impact is more evaluated holistically. You really need to look at the quality of life, of job creation, of social impact, of environmental impact. So impact is, is seen more on a, on a holistic and transversal way than, than, in, than in a silo. Now you need a return. A, any, a good idea can be a fantastic idea. If you don't have the, the return portion of it, you'll, you'll never be able to finance it. Now, uh, a return could also mean cost efficiency. So it's not necessarily means that, that you need to have a market or sales. Uh, it could also mean reducing cost. And we see a lot in, in building efficiencies or, or fl transport fleets that are turning from, from petrol to electricity, especially in Quebec, they see a lot of cost efficiency. And when you do the economical models by reducing their cost, uh, the bottom line of these organizations are higher. So you, you need to embed in the model some sort of a return. And a very, very important element is scalability. Any good idea that is just a one-off is very interesting, but nowadays it, it's it's a bit futile. You know, like so when when your if if your project is great but the cost of producing is are pro prohibitive, then you have to review the model and go back to the drawing board because scalability is really where you'll be able to unlock and unleash greater financing and have your impact. Now the other thing that that's very uh, I would say almost particular to this type of financing is partnership. Um, often in, in, in traditional financing, and when I was in the private sector, is when you have the secret sauce, you keep it for yourself. Um, in, in this sector, collaboration is really key. Um, we're, we're, we're looking for impact. So you don't see the other people in the network as competitors, you rather see them as partners. How do you leverage their expertise? How do you collaborate? How do you build synergies to, to bring the model forward? So uh, par partnership is important. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. We need to, to drive it forward. So, so I think when, when you present a project or an opportunity, the more stakeholders or the more P 
people in, in the landscape that you include, the, the stronger your case is. And then obviously you look for capital. So you, you, you have to find the, the right product for the scale at which your project is at. And I'll go, I'll, I'll go a bit in deeper in that uh, in, in a second. But the other thing is, especially in infrastructure, infrastructures are so expensive, is that you, you have to use these channel of, of uh, climate financing or impact finance to leverage, to go get the traditional financing um, sector. Uh, right now, it's obvious, and, and uh, I mean, I'm talking to researchers, so you probably know this better than I do, but uh, to, to reach the sustainable development goal, to, 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 to go where we want to be in terms of uh, reduction of, of uh, greenhouse gas emission, if we don't have the private sector involved in this, it's futile. So how do we use our climate financing? How do we use innovative financing, uh, similar to what um, we, we've heard about, um, throughout the different presentation, how do you use that to go get the, the traditional financing? And, and I'll get that into a bit more practical of what, what it means really when the bills hit the time. So uh, I mentioned in financing, so you got these funds right across the pension funds and they're talking about in financing, uh, which is not to be confused with ESG finance. Really, in term, ESG financing is more do no harm. As, as long as you, you know, you're, you're not doing harm, you're okay. Rather than um, impact financing, these are projects that are intentionally designed to bring forward social, environmental, climate change solutions. So embedded in the design has to be uh, impact. So you're looking at a triple bottom line, not just return, but also what, what are you doing for society? What are you doing for environment? And that's very important. Uh, like I mentioned, you need a, a return. So this is different from, from philanthropy, but like, like uh, Erica was explaining, you can use philanthropy to go get um, private sector money, but technically impact financing necessarily implies a return. And the return could be below market because these investors are very interested in, in, in the, the impact. So they don't want their capital to go as a grant and, and, and not ever seeing their money back. They're expecting a return. But they, often these, these, um, these funds that are in, in, in impact finance are willing to accept a lower risk return ratio than the market to have the impact. Uh, these assets, they're into all the, the asset class, whether it's debt, equity, and we'll go uh, in that a bit further. And the, another really important thing is, is the impacts they need to be measurable. Uh, it's more than just a good idea and say, oh, uh, we think we'll do this. We, you need to have very clear indicators on how you're going to measure impact. And, and um, it goes beyond the, uh, the more um, scientific calculation of reducing green gas emission. There are also uh, qualitative indicators of how you affect quality of life, of how you affect uh, like I mentioned a bit earlier, like the, the social inclusion, gender, all the, these different elements are included in, in these indicators. And so, so it's, it's clear that you have to report on it at the end of the day. And there's different certification, like we mentioned uh, throughout the day, the PRI, there's IFC came up with the, the uh, OPIM principles. There, there's different types of, of indicators of, of uh, accreditation or standards that you can go back to. And one of the obvious ones is the sustainable development goals, which are indicators of where the international community wants to. So when you have a project, you're not reporting out there. You're, you can rally the level of where the international community goes, and you can report against that. Um, so the type of financing, impact financing, you can get depending on where you're at in your project. You look at pilots or prototypes or research, this is more a grant, right? Like you, you have to find an investor that's willing to, to forget the money, but is also willing to invest in this. These investors can then turn on, on anyone on that to invest in your project. So the, the way you look at this government programs is like it's such a rich ecosystem to find this stuff of financing. There's nonprofit, there's foundation, there's funding, like the, the Montreal Climate Fund. And, and the key is to find what Erica was talking about, mission related. Every one of these programs or fund have a very particular mission in mind 
and for us, in our case, it's funny. So you have to define each of these um, organizations. Um, you can't do it. You know, um, this is when you enter uh, yeah, Friday, yeah, long, yeah, burn, and into incubators. In Montreal, again, there's a very itch, rich uh, ecosystem of incubators where they pr also provide technical assistance um, to, to help these, the, these companies structure and, and move on and, and reach scale or reach the next level of financing. So you have angel investor, venture capital, and many of these are very impact focused. The, these, these, uh, a lot of these organization uh, venture caps, they're really looking for focus and that's enough for your startup cost, which then enables you to go to more structured financing, institutional investors, pension funds and banks, which often they do have these specific funds for so uh, social finance structure, where again, they look at these projects with the dimension of impact. But at this stage, you, you, you have your governance, you probably have um, a proven uh, case study, proven business model, and then you can move on to these, these offerings on, on, the, on in, in the whole financial landscape. So when I talk about leverage, and that's the point I find really interesting, if you look at us, the, the Greater Montreal Climate Fund, we're, we're funded with a $30 million endowment. So similar to the McConnell, a lot of it will go in an impact portfolio, which will be invested in another fund, and a small portion will go to direct impact investing. Now, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good amount, but it, it's still quite modest if you look at the problem we want to tackle, and especially, like it was mentioned earlier, when you're talking about infrastructure, it's quite um, important amount. So we really need to find how you leverage. How do you use this money to go attract more money? And, and, and it's a term we use often, but I wanted to give you clear, um, very practical way of how money can be leveraged to attract private capital. So uh, the Greater Montreal Climate Fund is a nonprofit fund, which sounds a bit counterintuitive, but really all it means is that all the revenues we're gonna generate and create are going to go back into initiative and back into funding projects, right? So what we want to do with our capital is, is to rebalance the risk and return ratio. So in the private sector, it's, it's quite simple. They look at a potential return and they, they evaluate against the risk they're going to take. And if, if, they, if the, the return isn't big enough for the risk they're willing to take, then, then they're not going to make a deal. But if you, can, if you can go change that risk, if, you, if you're able to de-risk the investment, then you're able to go get private uh, sector capital for less return expected. So like I mentioned, we can give grants, which is the early stage development. So already the, the operational capital is funded, then the private sector investor could come and automatically put the, the money into capital expenditure. We can do direct investment so bring equity in a project at a very, very early stage when there's more risk and then prove the business model. And once the business model is proven, then more traditional financing can come because we have a business case. Concessional fi financing, we will be offering lower interest rate on debt or we'll, we'll accept lower return on net equity compared to a, a private sector investor at the condition that the, the the project developer brings the private sector. You know what I mean? So if we invest a million at a lower rate of return, the conditional to them bring 10 million. So that's how we leverage. And then for the private sector, it de-risks the, their investment because suddenly they have capital expecting less return. Uh, subordin uh, subordinated debt. So debt that's not, doesn't have collateral um, and lower rank debt, meaning that uh, if you have many creditors, we're, we'll be willing to be the last one paid and eventually of, of a failure, which again de-risks your project. Uh, we'll offer loan guarantees, uh, similar to the McConnell Foundation, program financing. Also, we're able to put many projects in one portfolio, that way you de-risk the investment. And then we can syndicate financing, meaning we'll find, because of our network, we can fund a lot of investors willing to fund a project. That way you also de-risk your investment. 
And another interesting thing that we're going to be looking at is marginal cost financing, because we know that often there's a base cost of what you want to do, but if you want to do it right, there's an additional cost. But for us, doing it right is 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 the the focus that that's our priority. So we'll be looking at financing just the incremental cost uh, in in relation to your base cost to capture the impact. So these are, are, are just practical tools of what it looks like to use impact finance. And, and like I mentioned, what are the criteria to access this impact finance and then how to use it to go get traditional finance. So it was a short and sweet presentation. And, and the reason is just because we don't have yet uh, statistics or, or success stories or, or graphs to show because we haven't started, but uh, I encourage you to stay tuned because uh, there's great, great opportunities in Montreal and we're really looking forward to be more engaging. Thank you so much, Marie-Claude. This was really uh, fantastic to have this run <laughs> and to be part of this, uh, to be launched soon, uh, Climate Fund. It, it gives great insights and I think it's like an appetizer. And it, it's like um, kind of like uh, giving a taste of uh, what we can wait for and hope for to really make a change in here because it's like it's happening in Montreal. We don't speak about the EU and about BlackRock. We, we can speak about Montreal. And um, as well, uh, before what Erica told, it's about Montreal. We can have access here to this um, kind of impact uh, financing instruments. It was for me um, getting clear when you said very much like risk and de-risking, that this is the key, basically, that mm -hmm. we can have the whole um, discussion today that it's about de-risking and uh, sharing like the risks until the traditional financial industry tools, whatever can come on board again. And there are several things like, uh, I just want to go back to regulation a bit, but th this is one part, but as well, like um, I think to get many persons on board to really have this impact and the impact is starting, like it's to see everywhere. Like, I mean, we are here in the national team as well. And we heard from Europe and Switzerland and, and so on as well. So I think uh, it was great to hear that. Thank you so much for your time and for for the delay <laughs> taking this still. And um, yeah, I'm wondering, are there uh, questions from panelists? Like uh, some panelists had to leave, unfortunately, already due to other appointment schedules and so on. And we have quite a long meeting. Um, are there some questions from the class as this kind of webinar is meant as well in the frame of a summer course. I'm wondering if all the students are still online or sitting in front of a plate with spaghetti. Um, there are coming no questions. Are there questions from the panelists? Not so far. Okay, so um, I'm wondering, Ursula, do you want to kind of wrap up or uh, like i see that the time is passing and if no one is anymore so much like hey, i need to discuss now um then i would say we can just um promise to follow up with each of you i think each of you had a fantastic valuable insights and we would be very delighted to follow up uh, if it's in this project with Lachine Est or for future projects in whole Montreal, there are many cool projects coming up and uh, the Next Generation Cities Institute uh, is starting and uh, we try to be change agents, to educate change agents, future decision makers. And we want to team up with everyone who wants to be part of this change. And um, yeah, maybe I just give the last word to Ursula as she's the Zerg. And uh, once more, thanks from my side. It was a pleasure to have you. Okay, thanks, Michael. Thanks, Marie Claude, for this presentation. And obviously, I mean, there's a lot of questions, um, especially um, around our very concrete case study here in, in Montreal, where we're going to propose some solutions. And so it would be would be really we probably would need more time to 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 understand better what the climate fund can, could do in such a sort of district development project where I think all the aspects are, are in there. So it's, I think it's a great opportunity. 
So thanks everybody for joining. I also uh, learned a lot on um, the financing issues and I think we, we see some solutions emerging and, and as my Claude said, I mean, they need to finally translate back to the to concrete projects and to the facilitation of of uh, ambitious uh, zero carbon inclusive projects. So um, we'll see. We, we do our best to support this to make it happen in, in Montreal and, and beyond. So thanks again, everybody. And let's stay in touch. I'll just uh, say a couple of words on behalf of all of us here at Force Space. Uh, thank you all for being here, sharing your expertise um, and participating in the discussion. Thank you to Dr. Eker, all of her students going strong through this intensive deep dive. I love Michael's comment about the plate of spaghetti. <laughs> it is indeed that time. Thank you, Michael, uh, for suggesting we make this session accessible publicly. The recording of today's presentations will be available on our website, concordia.ca slash four. And of course, it's already on Facebook now. So those of you on social media, please do follow us. Check us out at cu 4 space to keep up with the multitude of workshops, conversations, and uh, interdisciplinary kind of content that we are producing. Until next time, thanks for being here. And we'll see you on July 15th for your final presentations. Bye, everybody.